So magandang uh, tanghali po. Uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to the Pasig City Training on E-Mobility. Uh, this is being delivered on behalf of uh, or within the Solutions Plus project, which is a uh, global uh, e-mobility project that is being supported by the European Commission as a H2020 project, Horizon 2020 project, and we're doing this as part of a uh, string of training activities globally. So a few weeks before, before we were uh, uh, we conducted an Asia-wide training on e-mobility, and, and those were followed by uh, city-level trainings for Kathmandu as well as in Hanoi. So today we would be talking um, mostly about the, the planning for EV charging, and we are going to be uh, blessed by a distinguished panel of speakers. I'll be going through um, them, uh, the, their bios later. But uh, just to start, uh, just a few basic information about the session. So first, uh, please note that the uh, session is being recorded. The recording and the presentations will be made available afterwards. The session is also being live streamed from the Clean Air, Clean Air Asia Facebook page. Um, I've uh, put the uh, the link po in the chat box natin. If you can also share it uh, to, to your colleagues who might be interested in watching, that would be great. Um, and uh, secondly, we have muted everyone by default, so the session you know won't be uh, disrupted accidentally. Um, but when you talk later during the discussions, just click on the microphone icon. And um, if you encounter any challenges on that, please send us a message. Um, you can also choose to have your camera on. Um, but however, just to minimize disruptions, kindly switch them off during the presentations and in, in the meantime. And we can have the Q&A later during, and then you can switch it back on. Um, if you have questions, Paul, please submit them via the, uh, the chat box. Or um, we also encourage um, um, this session to be uh, interactive. So if you want to talk, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. So um, we would have dedicated time for uh, discussions later. Um, but yeah, um, if, if you do have uh, questions within, you know, during the presentation, you can chat them um, in the chat box. Um, for also for, for um, um, sorry, can you go back, please? Sorry. Um, so yeah, the naming convention po natin mas makakatulong sa amin if you can also put the organization name after your name. Uh, ganyan lang po, ano? And then again, please feel free to ask uh, questions. The the session is uh, we we have um, several distinguished uh, international speakers today. Um, but yeah, please. Uh, Please feel free if you want to, you know, post questions later. If you're Filipino, Taglish, uh, yeah, it would be great. Um, most important to us ngayon yung ano, interaction din. So next slide, please. <clears throat> ah, okay. So just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Alvin Mihi. I work for the Hupital Institute and we're part of the uh, Solutions Plus project, um, which is uh, aiming to accelerate the uptake of e-mobility globally. And the project is working with uh, 10 uh, demonstration cities globally in Asia. Uh, Pasig is a key city that we are working with. Um, next slide, please. Okay, just to give you an outlook. Um, so the first day for, uh, again, this is being uh, done as part of the Pasig City um, trainings for the Solutions Plus. We have talked about the operation and maintenance of EVs in the first day. And yesterday we had um, a close look at the different policy tools um, towards accelerating e-mobility while balancing uh, uh, priority goals in terms of safety and access. And today we would be talking about the planning for EV uh, charging. And uh, tomorrow, uh, which would be the last day, we will be talking about the e-mobility transition at the city level, roles, and applications. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, today, uh, it's all about EV charging, which is a key pillar for um, the uptake of e-mobility. Um, usually, po ang discussions um, at the level no, ng, ng mga developing countries and cities, mostly right now, is still being concentrated on the uh, ele electric vehicle side of things. But we also need to recognize the, um, the importance 
or the prerequisite of uh, EV charging and EV charging infrastructure policies as well as regulations. So today we would be um, talking about uh, these concepts and um, we have a distinguished panel of um, uh, speakers today. Uh, we would first go through um, uh, the Philippine case um, with Ms. Dang Terante of Global Electric Transport or GET um, in terms of ensuring safe charging um, based on their experiences uh, on the ground. Um, next uh, presenter, we would have Vittorio Ravello from uh, CRF who will be talking about the technical prerequisites and considerations for EV charging. And then we'll go later um, to the charging types and standards in the Philippine settings. Doc Manny Biona will be talking about that. Um, we have uh, Dr. Chu Rei Cheng from the National Ken uh, Kung University would be talking about experience in Taiwan, and uh, Nuwong Sulakuk, uh, Dr. Nuwong is uh, also from uh, uh, Thailand. No? From, he would be talking about the, the role of governments and EV charging development uh, in, in Thailand. So if you see, um, we just switch lang po kasi yung, ano natin, yung presentations natin with Doc Manny and Ms. Dang because of uh, scheduling conflict, but supposedly the technical presentations will be upfront and then the experiences um, uh, later on, but we uh, we accommodated the the need for the change in schedules. Um, so yes, I guess um, before we start the presentations, po, uh, quick survey lang sa atin, sa atin lahat. If you can just go to slido.com, if you can use the um, another uh, browser window or kahit sa cellphone po gumagana naman yan. If you go to slido.com and uh, input the code. Uh, as you see in the screen, 815-058. Um, to, to answer this question, this is a uh, word cloud question. Um, Mag-type lang po kayo ng, ng keywords na naiisip nyo. When you hear the word or the phrase electric vehicle charging, what are the key challenges that come to mind when you hear the phrase electric vehicle charging? Um, we would uh, give you maybe a minute to do so, um, just to get a feel of um, the concepts that you're thinking of, and also for our um, uh, speakers who are already um, joining us now, to you know to, to give you know give them a better idea of uh, what is the the thinking behind the uh, the challenges. Essentially, bakit tayo na dito ngayon? So we have a lack of charging facilities, um, challenges regarding location, charging um, challenges regarding standards, infrastructure, accessibility, compatibility is very important, interoperability, no? Um, yes, compatibility is uh, now being highlighted. I will give you a couple more seconds or maybe a minute or so. Uh, it's very interesting to see the uh, the insights now. And lucky in terms of compatibility, in terms of uh, infrastructure. And lumalabas, uh, iba pa, budget requirements, costs, um, safety. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, accessibility, infrastructure, and compatibility. Um, yeah, definitely these were some of the key um, challenges that uh, we actually uh, took into consideration. And uh, if you can see the uh, the key guide questions that were um, developed, uh, co-developed also with our uh, colleagues from Cleaner Asia, from uh, the Pasig, uh, uh, Pasig Transport, CTDMO, um, in terms of... Um, designing the, the program for today. So maraming maraming salamat po. It's a very um, comprehensive list that's uh, coming up here. Uh, so yeah, compatibility, accessibility, infrastructure, and uh, a lot of uh, insights in terms of the budget, the cost, and um, other issues on, on safety, uh, locations, and uh, yeah, um, these are the kinds of things that we would definitely uh, talk about today. So, maraming salamat po sa inyong participation. Um, siguro without uh, further ado, I, uh, we can now go through the second slide. Salamat po for the, for the slide. We'll take note of the results as well in terms of documenting. Maraming salamat. Yeah, I'm very privileged to um, introduce to you our first speaker. 
uh, Ms. Dan Terante. Ms. Dan Terante is a, a veteran in operations and management, having pioneered the operations of Taguig City's uh, command and con contact center. She currently serves as the Global Electric Transport Fleet Operations Manager, overseeing on-the-ground activities across the Philippines. Uh, this makes her responsible for ensuring and improving the performance productivity of GETS Electric Fleet. Her extensive involvement in public service has given her a strong grasp of interpersonal relations um, needed to handle both employees and passengers, as well as the skill sets to optimize mass uh, development. So we, she would be talking about uh, the experience uh, from the Philippines, um, ex the, the, the work that they're doing um, in GET in terms of ensuring uh, safe uh, charging. Pool. So Ms. Dan, can you hear us? Yes, good afternoon everyone and thank you for having me. Uh, we uh, actually, I'm quite in, uh, excited that more and more people are getting interested in e-mobility. E we believe it's about time that we educate the people on what our near future would be because we are seeing in 10 years, internal combustion engine or ice could be a thing of the past. I'm quite happy as well because the topic assigned to me is ensuring safe charging experience from the Philippines. We have been in the business for quite some time now, managing fleets of fully electric vehicles so I think I can relate to this matter. So with that, let me start my presentation with this quote from Karen Salmason. What if I told you that 10 years from now, your life would be exactly the same? I doubt that you would be happy. So why are you so afraid of change? I think, uh, well, this is based on our experience, my experience personally, uh, different, uh, I think the only reason that people are a bit scared of change is because they don't know what's out there. And sometimes other people tend to make it hard for common people well, like me to understand the situation. So I'd like to simplify this by me asking questions to the audience. What if I tell you that a few kilometers away from Pasig City Hall, there's a gasoline station? Will you be afraid of it? I don't think so. On the other hand, especially for drivers like me, you will be assured knowing that if your gas is low, you just need to fuel it up and you will reach your destination without worrying, worrying that your vehicle will stall along the way. And so what if I tell you that the charging station that we are discussing now will simply replace the existing gasoline stations that we have. Should it cause for an alarm? I think it shouldn't, but rather it should make you feel relieved. All we are saying is, if we are de deploying electric vehicles, it is imperative that we also set up charging stations. This is what happened from before when we started introducing internal combustion engine. We also set up gasoline stations for this. And I'm pretty sure that back then, they encountered the same issue we are facing now. But of course, again, the question I, I saw in the, in the survey, Alvin, it, one of the concern is safety and yes, other sir. infrastructure, mm -hmm. most com compatibility, I, I agree with you. So I, I wanna shed some lights on some matters. You might not, I might not be able to answer all. Uh, let me just show you this slide. This is a seven kilowatt charger that we are currently using in our operations in Davao. It's a slow charger. So you're, you'll, you'll be seeing there, there's two port wherein you can plug. The first one is for the seven kilowatt charger or the slow charger as we call it. Okay, this is being used while we are not using the vehicles or mostly at night. So while they are being parked, we are also charging the vehicles. We are doing this because we need to be sure that all the cells inside the battery are balanced. And since it's just seven kilowatt, charging hours is long, longer compared to the other chargers. That's why it's advisable to use it 
while you're not using the vehicle or it's being parked at night. Now this next slide. That one is the 50 kilowatt fast charger. The fast charger is being used while we're doing operations because we need to we need to be sure that there's a little delay in the operation as much as possible. Okay. Let me just go back to this one. I guess uh, for most, uh, the question also is, what if we overcharge? Especially if we're doing uh, overnight charging, there's a possibility that your personnel might fall asleep and then left the charger plug and you, worry, and you might worry, what if? something goes wrong but we actually uh, have this in mind before we start operations and so we make sure the technology that we're using is safe enough this low charger actually uh, once it reach 100 percent capacity of the battery it will and then you forget to unplug it it will slowly drop its state of charge so meaning if it reach 100% and the plug is still there, it's still on, slowly it will go from 100 down to 99, 98, so on and so forth. So uh, overcharging is not possible. And somehow it's the same with the fast charger. But this one, if you see here, let me just say it. So once you plug it there, this charger should be able to communicate with the vehicle. You're seeing it there. Setting up communication with the car. There. So you see there, sorry, that the, the, the charger now knows that the vehicle state of charge is up to 58% only. And so it will charge the vehicle. Then when it reached 100%, it will automatically stop. The charger would now know that it, it's already 100%, so she has to stop charging. And this is, again, I, we're using this for our uh, day operations, and we're just using this for opportunity charging. Uh, some of you might uh, ask why are we saying opportunity because basically we're just taking advantage of the opportunity that the vehicles are in the terminal waiting for passengers and sometimes it would just take you five ten minutes maybe sometimes longer depending on the hour and that is good enough for us so that we can bring back what was used in the trip so what is happening is let's say i let's use uh, my uh Balinswell, i'm sorry uh, manila to sm north route what happened is if you leave um manila and then you go to sm north where we have fast charger you just need to you you you'll, you are there for like five ten minutes and while waiting you're charging and then you Make another trip again, and then the same process. When you uh, go back to SM North, you will do the same. Now, what are the factors we considered in setting up charging stations? Uh, there are key points that we have to consider in planning for charging station. And one of, the, one of those is the source of power or electricity. This will not only bring down cost of infrastructure when we set up chargers, 
but this will also speed up the process because if there is no available power that is needed for the like this one this one is a 60 kilowatt charger the one that you're seeing in the picture and it, it requires 400 volt so if you don't have that power in that location you need to set up transformer and then you have to do infrastructure pa it would take time of course not to mention the permitting and all then you also have to consider strategic location. Again, I go back to my analogy of gasoline stations, just like how they are setting up or, or how they set up their gasoline stations. We also want that our uh, charging station is accessible to the users and located where more people can use it. But then again, I saw uh, earlier uh, the space they're asking, there, there's no available space. I, I, I think I would agree on that also. And then also you have to consider your clients your cost, or your customers because if you set up charging stations, you have to make sure it's somewhere, somehow nearby your clients. Thereby making sure that if you need to charge up, it's just around the corner. And then of course, the size of the vehicles or the size of battery, because battery uh, varies depending on who's producing it and what's being produced. And there are also different uh, chargers. There's what, like what I've shown you already, we have seven, 50, 60, there's also 20, 30. So depending on the size of the battery, you have to consider which of those you want to set up or to use. And then of course the number of vehicles because uh, you have to know how many potential vehicles will be using that station because you have, we also need to consider the size of the area. The next question is, what are the relevant policy and technical considerations. The relevant pa policy, I think uh, most of you are aware, or if not, there's a Senate bill. Uh, it's Senate Bill 1382. It's an act providing the national energy policy and regulatory framework for the use of electric vehicles and the establishment of electric charging stations. Uh, we are hoping uh, this one will be passed soon because it's about time that we have this policy in place, especially now that we're gearing into this uh, e-mobility. Okay, and then I, I saw then also one of the issue raised is compatibility. I, 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 I agree with that. There has to be a charging standard. Uh, just charging standard, there is a lack of consistent standards for charging infrastructure across and within most EV markets. It is important that partners in the deployment of this infrastructure in a city have a clear and shared understanding of which types and standards of chargers are included in their plans. Just like in our existing uh, internal combustion engines right now, we have one that requires gasoline while other is using diesel. It's actually the same with electric vehicle, but this one we're calling it protocol. They have the, we have different protocol. Uh, I, I think it should be Doc Biona who's supposed to explain the charging types and standard. And I hope I'm not preempting his presentation, but I'd like to share that there are different protocols in the uh, charging business. There is one. There is a common one, char uh, Chademo. It actually came from Charge the Move. So Charge the Move is short is Chademo. Uh, and then there's Combined Charging System, which is CCS. And the one is Guviao. It's a uh, national Chinese national standard, or uh, commonly known as GBT. Charging station for the charging stations that we uh, want to set up. I we we believe that it's we need to have at least both the demo and CCS and or CCS 
because they're uh, DC chargers, meaning it's fast. While GBT can actually be set up in your uh, place, in your house, in your office, in the parking area, because this one is just AC and does not require high voltage. Now, what are the different uh, roles? The, uh, what are the roles of the different stakeholders in the development of charging networks? Oops, sorry, is spelled. Uh, and the promotion of EV charging. Okay, there are different roles, and uh, I highlighted few of them, but there, there is, there's more to it, not just this one. So, of course, the Department of Energy. Uh, I got this actually from the Senate bill that I mentioned earlier. Department of Energy is tasked with promoting the adoption of electric vehicles and the development of charging infrastructure, while ERC or Energy Regulatory Commission is the one who's regulating the charging cost. The Department of Transportation uh, is tasked with the development of policies for EV demand generation because we're also saying even though we have chargers in place and no one is using it, it's still not good. Now, the Department of Industry is responsible for industry development of EVs, charging station, parts, components, and batteries. I think we are all aware that right now, uh, Philippines is not yet ready for this. We, for one, uh, I mean, our company, for one, is uh, forced to import vehicle because we don't have the capability capability to do one here locally and even for the chargers but it's a good thing that we are partnering with imi they're into the fast charger now and hopefully one of these days they will deploy their own fast charger we also need local government units to identify local public transport route plans and include the electrification of EUVs and issuance of certificate of inspection to charging stations. And then let's not forget, forget Bureau of Internal Revenue. Uh, most of the player now in this space are just start up, not a big company. And it would be a great help if there's a tax incent incentives in the importation of chargers and electric vehicles. And there's actually more. I could go on and on and on. Hello? Yes, Ms. Dan, go ahead. Okay. And then my next slide is, what are the main considerations related to battery swapping? So you're seeing two pictures here. The concept of battery swapping is you have this battery there you can see it it's safe secured by this and then you have to plug it get one and then replace the uh, the, the battery that you have in this case uh, it's a mo uh, motorcycle and then you just get one and then put back the other battery that you have in your unit this actually is the concept of battery swapping and this one that you're seeing is not a battery swapping okay and to answer what are the main considerations related to battery swapping first you have to consider that there will be additional costs to purchase extra batteries you need additional resources such as manpower and logistics you also uh we saw someone doing uh, battery swapping and they're using for clipper disc because it's quite heavy and you also need to understand that there's a potential damage to the unit with the repeated plugging and unplugging, just like any household appliance that you have. It's not safe that you plug and unplug them, or it's not advisable. Let's say you're, you, you have this, uh, you have your refrigerator, you're not supposed to do plugging and unplugging. Look, and then the safety issues with exposed batteries. Uh, you don't want it as much as possible to just be sitting there, especially in the terminals, open to everyone. 
And again, this, the, the battery swapping is only for small vehicles and is not suitable for larger vehicles. And I think that concludes my presentation for this afternoon. I hope I was able to uh, shed some light on the topic. Maraming salamat po, Ms. Uh, Dang. No? It's a very uh, insightful presentation that uh, you have given us. Uh, siguro, ang, um, balikan lang natin yung mga sinabi niyo in terms of, uh, firstly, I think uh, it's very important uh, the first thing that you said in terms of uh, also need to change the mindset and perceptions um, mm -hmm. while we're transitioning to 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 e-mobility. You've talked about uh, key points to consider. Essentially, parent essential checklist. Not you know, you, you've uh, gone through um, um, looking at the source, strategic locations, um, importance of clients and customers, and importance yeah. of um, of integrating young in charging with the vehicles and the services that are being offered. Um, and then you've also highlighted the importance of uh, standards, the importance, uh, I think uh, that those would be uh, expounded later on by Doc Manny and uh, Vittorio. And then uh, in terms of the importance of the roles of the different uh, stakeholders, uh, which we would also hear about later on from Dr. Nuong and Dr. Chure, international experiences. And um, it's very important that you also highlighted the, uh, the or, or parang inability, the industrial or challenges with, in, in terms of the industrial capacity of the, the country uh, currently, um, both in terms of the vehicles, uh, also in terms of the charging and the components in terms of producing this. Um, siguro po, um, if we can hear some questions, we have a couple of questions from Ms. Vicky. Um, um, in the chat. Uh, and for everyone else, Bo, we also encourage you to either chat or raise your hand, Bo, para mas interactive din tayo. Um, but we can accommodate uh, the questions now from Ms. Dang kasi she would not be able to join the rest of the, the, the session and will not be able to join the Q&A. So we can go through Ms. Vicky's uh, questions first, if that's okay. Um, the first one, ano po yung ano, what are the maintenance activities being done for the charging stations? And if you can share some, some insights on the unit costs um, that the, the users would pay when charging. I think yung second question, Ms. Vicky, you're thinking about uh, parang ano, private uh, EV owners. Ata. Ms. Vicky, is that uh, correct? But anyway, Ms. Dang, if you can uh, first go through yung mga maintenance activities uh, that you're doing Actually, for the charging station. Actually, that's a good thing for, ano, no, hmm. for, the charging, uh, for the chargers that we're using. There's uh, less maintenance to that. Okay. And because uh, there, this is actually more on programming. So for you, for us to update that, it, we just need to, to connect it to an internet and then our uh, supplier will just remotely update the charger. So mm. there, there's really not much to it. Okay. And siguro po yung uh, Ms. Dang, if you can also give us um, an insight or if you can tell us the story in terms of the timeline that you go through from conceptualization to charger installation. Gano ba kahaba ito? And you've talked about yung mga different challenges, but siguro in relation, for example, to your interactions with, uh, for example, the local government units, what are the key insights, um, challenges, and, you know, maybe some, if you have uh, insights in terms of uh, recommendations, in terms of uh, potential, uh, you know, um, improvements in terms of interaction with local governments, what they can do, um, all these, uh, uh, parang, uh, to facilitate uh, these types of uh, uh, transition towards, um, Putting up more, you know, or, or aiding the uh, the uh, EV charging infrastructure development in at the ground. So, ganu ba katagal, for example, from conceptualization to installation? Naabot insa. Well, actually, based on our experience, uh, Alvin, uh, first the 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 problem we encountered is uh, with the LGU for the securing of uh, building permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so we hope that one day there will be a green lane for this but yeah I, and i guess it's common can i say common that mm. we secure uh permits 
usually takes time. And then, of course, again, uh, the other experience is if we don't have the transformer or the power that is needed, it's additional setup that we need to consider. So it would mm. take time. Uh, before, I think it took us like three months. And then, but for the Dabao, since we partnered with Dabao Light, mm. it's actually a month. A month. And mm. we were able to install the charger. So talaga na expedite through the, the strategic partnership, no? Yes, that mm -hmm. is correct. Yes. Um, very uh, insightful yung sinabi niya with regards to the permitting. This was actually something that we discussed yesterday in mm -hmm. terms of the different uh, parang, uh, policy instruments. Um, marami din kasing ginagawa sa international arena. So, kunyari sa US, so they have certain, or the, the local government, the cities have instituted mga certain um, process uh, incentives kumbaga, for if you want to install a charger even for you know for homeowners, locators, uh, building owners na yun nga, to speed up the process, mga one-day types of inspection um, so uh, as well as yung mga iba nagwe-wave din ng fees for, for some of these things so very important po yung sinabi niya um, we, mm, go ahead I, I saw the message from the PASIC engineer yes. Lisa Nagustin Lisa mm. afternoon I will agree on you. I have to agree on you on that. Pasig is, uh, no, in, in, it's not long down to, to secure permit in Pasig. Okay. Projects like this. Problem is ERC and where are we? Nice. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Pom. Uh, Engineer Noli. Nice to see you Good here. Good afternoon, yeah. Engineer. Mm -hmm. Engineer Noli is in charge of the uh, 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 solar project in Pasig. So magandang... Uh, uh, it's good great will, to hear that we'll, you're here. Yeah, uh, we will actually reach out to you soon, sir, because we intend to set up charger in uh, Ayala 30. So we hope you can also accommodate us. <laughs> Sige po. Maraming salamat. Meron po pa tayong ibang questions uh, for, for the other participants po. Um, Okay, you can chat me. You have a couple of minutes. Um, but before, siguro pa while we wait, kung meron pa man, uh, Ms. Dang, do you have uh, any uh, siguro uh, parting message no? before you close your session? Kasi hindi kayo makakasama mamaya sa, sa Q&A. Siguro ano lang, um, if... if um, what are the siguro... Two key points that you would like to remind everyone, um, takeaways from your presentation, a review, two or three key points um, that uh, you would want everyone to, to leave this room later with uh, those concepts in mind or recommendations. Actually, Alvin, for me, I think it's just one. Okay. Let's not be afraid of the unknown. That's very nice. You, you just add, I, I, someone told me that there is a genius in inquiry. You just mm. need to ask. And then you, you'll know the answer and then you will understand that there's really nothing to be afraid of. That's a very nice message. Maraming salamat, Ms. Nang. It has been a very insightful uh, session with you. Uh, thank you very much. No? Um, thank you. Maraming salamat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you um, So we now go to the second... Uh, to the second uh, presentation, which would be given by... Um, um, uh, Vittorio Ravello. So Vittorio Ravello um, is the Global Innovation Electrification Program Manager at Fiat Research Center, or CRF. He has more than three decades of uh, pro professional experience. He's an expert in the field of electric vehicles, uh, standardization, and e-powertrain systems. He currently leads the Green Vehicle Initiative in the Stellantis uh, Automotive Research and Advanced Engineering Organization. Um, he's also a, an external professor at the 
Polytechnico di Torino and IFP school in France, uh, teaching um, electric and hybrid propulsion systems and electric powertrains. And he has uh, um, um, published many papers in, in, in relation to alternative propulsion systems and electric drives. And he would be uh, talking uh, about the pre technical prerequisites and considerations for charging infrastructure. So Vittorio, um, can you hear us? <laughs> Thank you for the very kind introduction. As you have understood probably by the introduction, I am a technician. I will try not to bore you too much, but give you some uh, technical hints that probably is to be in my mind taken into account also for who has the role to decide strategies and policy in this specific case about the topic of the electric vehicle charging. In this slide, I put together two typical pictures. On the left, you see a classic refueling station, gas or in diesel, what it is. And on the right side, uh, um, an example of the new uh, DC fast charge one, the one that in the previous presentation, uh, the colleague uh, very detailed uh, explained to you. As you can see by the, the first glance looking at them, they seem similar. In the classical, there is a tube at the end of moving the fuel from a big tank under the road to the car. Here you see something that sounds similar. Technically speaking, obviously it's a cable with electricity in, but the shape, uh, the way in which you detach the unit by the station and you connect to the vehicle sounds very similar. So the message we want to transfer is uh, don't worry, you are not so much far from your traditional experience. It's just a matter to make pass uh, in one case, um, if you will, in the other electrons, but the story is not so much different. And that could be a way to see the story. And you know, each of us is a large experience probably in recharging batteries by our smartphone. So charging a smartphone or a laptop is a daily activity for near all of us. So it seems very uh, simple, not far from what we need. It's not rocket science. We don't need to become uh, super engineers to do that. But at the same time, the two processes are physically different. And that's something in my mind to be taken into account to be successful in doing it. What I want to mean, I mean that the two systems, as I said, seem similar, but when I compare more in detail them, there are differences. On the left, I put you the traditional, the fuel, and fuel is a transfer of liquid or gas, gas fuel in case you speak about a natural gas compressor, what it is meaning you move a fuel from a place to another one uh, is a transfer you pay the amount of fuel you transfer so what you pay is what you have transferred and uh, that's all when we speak about electricity it's not correct to imagine that charging is to take electrons from a place the grid and put the electrons in the car that's not the case electricity is a loop the electrons you put in on the positive cable comes out on the negative so if i measure the total number of electrons coming in and out, the delta is zero. Uh, so what happens? Uh, what happens is that these electrons moving in and then out make possible that chemical reaction take place. Charge a battery means that chemical reaction take place inside. Chemical reaction means not fast as can be transfer of fuel, means an efficiency, meaning that what you pay uh, charging the car is not one, one, the energy you will have to move the vehicle is something more what you pay than what you use. And this process has a significant aging effect. In the previous presentation, there has been some remarks on the need to make wise usage of the charging to avoid a too fast decay of the performance of the battery up to the replacement. We are not so used to this problem because with mobile, with smartphone, it's common to replace them each one, two years because that's the trend. In cars, uh, in vehicles, uh, in general, not. We are not open to replace big packs of batteries each two years, paying roughly one half of the value of the car. In terms of experience, uh, so the time I spent at the station, refueling is a very, very short uh, experience. It's fast. In a few minutes, one, two, three minutes, you can easily completely refuel your car. And maybe we are not so much aware, but don't forget that when you put the fuel in your car, in the pipe, in the pistol you see in the picture, is passing roughly a lot of uh, hundred of kilowatt up to 110 megawatt. This is the power transfer we are putting in our car. One car. Clearly, you can imagine if I want 
idea, ideally to do the same in my electric vehicle. If and imagine that each car under charge asks for one megawatt, you can immediately imagine which would be the effect on the grid infrastructure that is not sized to charge in a big cities in, in parallel 10,000 cars at one megawatt each. And so the story is different. In general, a complete recharging, the one going really to the 100% guaranteeing the proper balancing of the cell, what previously has been already mentioned in the first presentation, in general, ask for lower power. And in general, anyway, higher power can be critical at a different level, can be, as I was saying, impacting negatively the infrastructure and also the battery. And so the experience in this case is totally different. Don't forget that today the already clear winning electric vehicle are the one like trains, underground, uh, trolleybus, the one in which that energy exchange between the grid and the vehicle is continuous. You move the electricity to your train all the time the train is moving. And thanks to that, the power level can be lower because longer is the time, smaller can be the power to transfer the same energy. If we want to replace one-to-one -one the engine experience, that on the contrary is never connected to, to the infrastructure except at the time of charging, we need to use very, very high power very, very high power and better in general, if not correctly managed, can become very risky and dangerous. Here you see two pictures, one on the left in Paris of a car sharing of Bolloré. Bolloré was one of the most famous European car sharing. You see here vehicle under charge and the effect after the fire brigade's uh, action to extinguish the fire. Uh, and unluckily, you see on the right side an example of motor, electric motor bicycle. To tell you what, that undoubtedly the risk, the problem are bigger with higher energy, higher power, higher voltages. Said in another word, bigger vehicle, cars, buses, trucks. You can say in smaller, two, three, four wheelers, these value are lower in general, energy on board is less, voltage is lower, um, risk uh, due to the power you need, um, Two, and for some extent that's correct. In the previous presentation, you've seen a guy directly swapping the battery of his uh, moped. That's possible because the battery is small, is light. The voltage at the terminals is not dangerous. You can touch the battery without risking a shock. But at the same time, uh, being in general, some of the problem related to the chemistry, not only refer uh, to the size, but simply to the chemics, chemistry in, in itself, you can have big fires also with smaller vehicle. You can see on the right side also, because in general, smaller vehicle can be managed uh, with a lot of them all together. So some problem have to be addressed independently from the size and the typology. And the problem coming from the nature of the battery are at multiple domain. Are, can be electrical, we said shock, all what is over 60 volt direct current, if directly touched, can cause serious damages to the people having experience up to the death. So very dangerous. Lower this value, not, but arcs. So the problem coming to try to interrupt the current flowing in a cable for safety or for mistakes um, can be risky also with very low voltage because this depends on the current level, not on the voltage chemical and chemical again are independent from the voltage level. In some condition over voltage short circuit battery can emit toxic gases. And so inflated is in our body can be very dangerous. And not least, not last, but very important, uh, last in this list, but not least, the thermal battery, particularly lithium as a typical um, runaway potential phenomena, thermal runway in case there are problems in managing, and this can create a domino effect on the cell closer to that, uh, uh, risking to reach the fire condition. If you reach a fire condition with lithium ion, put water over, it is a typical practice, you know the story of Tesla, for instance, accelerate the reaction, so make shorter the time to extinguish the energy, but cannot stop the fire. So uh, it's something that has to be, in my opinion, but I think it's very trivial, correctly addressed earlier than the problem occurs. 
why is important uh, uh, the charging phase? Because charging phase is a phase where, in, except you do the charging in motion, the vehicle is not possible to be used as vehicle. When the vehicle is under charge, the vehicle is not, is not uh, moving. And uh, according to what I told you before, being the efficiency of charging not 100%, that is in between a charger and a battery, uh, it's clear that these two elements impact a lot because charging time means availability, and charging efficiency means what you pay. That, as I told you, can be, is in general, more than what you have. And depending how much bigger is this uh, window, the less the customer is happy and the uh, is a fit manager, the his business uh, model can be satisfied. So these are two very important elements we have not in our uh, today experience because charging time and refueling time for a traditional car is very short and the efficiency is one you pay the fuel you put in the car there is no let me say leakage also the way in which i connect the battery the charger to the grid has a large impact because in part of the user experience you have seen in a very useful and very uh, interesting video you have seen in the first presentation when you connect the small in that case was a type one connector of the AC low power charging, the seven kilowatt was defined. It's easy, it's a small connector, it's light, uh, the socket and plug can match very easily. Then in the second video, you've seen what can be done with a DC charge, higher power, that means immediately, heavier device, bigger connector, and also the force to be applied to connect the, the connector itself to the vehicle and to remove it uh, is not, uh, the equivalent to the other one. So this changes a lot. If you have a robotized system, obviously the experience can be smoother. If you have more um, enhanced solution like the wireless, the level of safety for who connect the vehicle to the grid are higher. So this is very relevant. And the electric safety is one effect of that. And not least, but not uh, last again, but not least the impact on the infrastructure. If I need a seven kilowatt, my grid in general is a already designed for. If I start to put everywhere 100 of kilowatt DC fast charger, I need to understand where and how to connect. If there is the proper power available, or I need to make a medium to low voltage transformation ad hoc for my needs. There are uh, different ways uh, depending the typology. We are today uh, used to speak about the first case, uh, the classical called conductive AC charging. So AC because in this cable is flowing the alternative current and the device making the DC for the battery is on board, the charger is on board. And this is the most common way, is the way we use uh, for the main part of experience. If you if you have a, a electric vehicle, an electric um, car or motorbike at all, that's the typical way to, to charge them. Or the last one, the last one is the DC fast charge. Be aware that it's a big difference. It's called DC because here this is flowing in the cable and going to the battery. But the big difference is that here the charger is on board, here the charger is off board. So the level of cost and complexity of this station in respect of the unit you have here to connect in a safe way, this cable is totally different. In this case, charger is totally on board. In this case, charger is totally off board. Charger is, is here, where here is the charger in this case. Third case uh, that is becoming a little more popular is the wireless. In the wireless, uh, the charger is split. One part of the charger can be, for instance, in the ground and one part under the car. If it is a bus, uh, the opposite can be on the roof and on the infrastructure. In this case, uh, you pass energy through the air. This acts like an insulating transformer, make the electrical safety experience uh, superior, but being air, the conductive element for the current and the field, here possible EMC, EMI, electromagnetic issue has to be addressed. So each solution has pros and cons. Um, as I said before, you can do with a continuous connection cables, the easy or, easy, or through the air. The two ways have these pros and cons, as I said you before. Uh, about charging time, the, the reason why the problem of the power is rising up uh, is coming from this very simple physical equation. The physical equation tells us that the energy we want to transfer in a device uh, is the product, except the efficiency, of power by time. Uh, meaning that 
if we want to have on board more and more energy, and this rush to have more and more energy on board is typical of cars. Tesla is one precursor of this theory, 100 and more kilowatt hour on board. Uh, clearly make uh, this number bigger. Why want this number bigger? Bigger is this number, higher is my vehicle range. So the number of kilometer I can do. If I want at the same time a shorter time to go closer and closer to the today engine experience, few minutes as our experience, again, I see this value uh, going down. So if I grow, rise up energy and I move down time, obviously the only way to match the needs is to increase power. And power, that's the reason why are becoming bigger and bigger. What means? Few examples. Here I put you for passenger cars, large, mid-size numbers, today numbers. This is, for instance, Tesla Model 3. This is, for instance, Tesla Model S. And here are the time. 20 for partial DC fast charge is a typical target time for today. Five can be the dream. If I put together the shorter time near like a car of today with gasoline and a big energy, that's what happened. To charge this vehicle, I would need, negligent the efficiencies, more than one megawatt. And one megawatt, obviously, is not something I have at my plug at home. So you can see with how big can be the impact of this choice, if needed. Trying, on the other hand, to see the story from the positive perspective, if I go to compare, complete my comparison with the gasoline, there is another big difference. With my gasoline diesel car, I go to make the fueling at the station, full stop. If I want to put electricity in my car, I have multiple potential options. I can do, if I have at home, a charging place in my garage, if I have a garage. I can do at work, if there are the infrastructure in my office, for instance. I can do in a public area, for instance, uh, at a mall, when I'm doing my shopping, or when I'm, I am at the cinema to see a movie. Or I can do having it on highway. So in what today are the classical gasoline station. These multiple options open the door to different choices and different blending. Clearly, it asks, as said before in the previous presentation, a combined action between who realize and fix the infrastructure and who want to use it. Clearly, having the plurality, if I have for the solution you see here, uh, the problem can become, at least for some vehicle, lower because some vehicle, the classical private, at the end, particularly in urban usage, are used five, ten percent of the day. So you have a lot of time to recharge them. You have the night to do it with lower power that helps also the grid to be less overloaded. Clearly, that can be true for some vehicle, not for others. If my vehicle is a professional vehicle and I want to operate it the more time that I can, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, I cannot only trust on that, I need far direction, but exploit this potentiality, changing the paradigm of when I go to make the refueling, in this case recharging, in my mind is the way to do it. Clearly the problem is how to organize this complexity. This complexity at the end move in this direction. Electricity is a great plus in respect of fuel. You can easily or technically easily transfer it. You can move electricity by a solar roof to a car, you can move it to a, a building and so on. And creating this electric ecosystem in which cars vehicle becomes part of the distribution and storage electricity grid of the cities could make a really the difference. Improving largely the quality of the air because I avoid the pollution in town, that is a very critical point for all of us, independent from the continent in which we live, all of us has the same problem at different level, but all of us has it, but it asks for planning. It asks for uh, defining the right technical solution with a scenario technologically in continuous evolution. That, that's another critical point. To reach the goal, um, and speaking about charging, where to put the charging station, clearly you have two levels. The first level is the geographical, where I physically put the station. And here, who has to plan the story has to understand and decide which is the maximum distance from one station to the closer that you want to accept. Discuss a lot accessibility. People have to go there and make charging. Better if it will be in future robotized. Today, in general, not. So I need to find a way to do it in a safe, easy way. The impact on the landscape. 
I live in Europe where there are old cities, where there are some city center area where to install a, a station to recharge vehicle is not possible for impact, a negative impact on the landscape. So also that is a point to be considered. Like the distance in respect of buildings. You have seen the example of fire attack in the case I show you. Uh, having this system closer to place where people is living can be a problem to be addressed with safety proper levels. But there is another element of the positioning to be considered. One is the physical position in the upper. The other is the connection to the grid. Because bigger is the charging station, more relevant is uh, to understand where my cable are connected to the grid. So the local impact that the system can have on the grid. And here, to leverage this high power I need, very relevant become possible functional synergies. There are already demo projects that show like if I have a tramway in my cities and the tramway in general will have a generative braking, put the energy in the grid, this energy can be used to charge the vehicle. And the vehicle parked, if bidirectional, can supply the peak during the acceleration of the tramway. So become a way in which the energy flows into direction, trying to make the best for both. Like hybrid solution are becoming more and more popular. DC big charger with batteries, with solar panel linked together to avoid peaks of power request to the grid are a good way to distribute the energy request in time, avoiding the negative effect on the grid with possible blackout condition. And the chance to move bidirectionally the energy through the vehicle becomes a very relevant future uh, element, meaning the battery in my car that is maybe parked at 10, year, 10 hour a day will be not only uh, something to be charged, but can be also a source of energy for transit needs. It obviously asks for a coordinated approach. The more we want to exploit this uh, wonderful future, the more the different players has to work together. The natural way each makes his business in this case doesn't give the result we would like to have. Uh, to tell you how difficult it is to reach the goal, uh, I present to you two slides, a uh, recent slide from the European Car Maker Association, showing which is the infrastructure situation in Europe. This is the classical Europe now without the United Kingdom. You see the different uh, country. Here is France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the others. Here is Russia, let's give you reference, and you are on, obviously on the right side of the picture. If you go to see the so-called Euro 27 situation, that's what we see. Just three countries, Netherlands, France, and Germany, has the 70% of the charging public capability in all Europe. And they cover less than 25% of the ground, of the physical ground of this colored area. So you can immediately see how not correctly, in a theoretical way, and not correctly distributed is this uh, infrastructure. That means that in this country, the blue one and maybe the green a little, you can imagine to exploit electric vehicle in a massive way. In the other is a dream. We can say tomorrow we want 100% electric vehicle, but under this condition is technically impossible. And as you can see, Europe has policy to try to address the story more, uh, we can say homogeneously, but it's not so easy. The same is uh, in terms of fast, not fast charging. If you consider 22 kilowatt as the border between the not fast charging, the seven uh, single phase, the 22 to the three phase, and the 22 and up or 50 and more, that's what you see. These are the different 27 um, European uh, countries. And in all of them, at the end, there is a big imbalance between the capability to make high power charging and low power. One station on nine is giving the fast capability that the newspaper present as available for everybody. So we are very, very far from the goal, also from this perspective. And to understand how much is the power I need for this fast charging, I need really a crystal ball. Why? Because as you can see, the power is growing up without any control. The 50 kilowatt already mentioned in the previous presentation was a few years ago a goal. I remember a study done by a company very expert in the field saying 50 kilowatt is more than enough. Now we reached 20 to 220 kilowatt. Someone is already speaking of solution for 
luxury car 350 kilowatt and for trucks and so on, Germany for instance, is deploying a grid at one megawatt. So you can immediately understand if you are the guys that put the money to have an infrastructure useful and applicable, how the moving from 50 kilowatt to one megawatt can totally change the story. Imagine I spend my money to have a very effective 50 kilowatt infrastructure in my country, then I want to use it in practice. And what I realized after a few years is that the goal was 20 times more. That means that I spend my money and it will never be back by my investment because infrastructure cannot be refurbished each two years. And here is very difficult to understand which is the right solution because everybody wants everything in the opposite. While if I speak about two, three, four wheelers, this power level are largely more than what I need. So again, which vehicle I want to address? Big buses, motor pad, cars, not so easy also that to be understood. Now there will be a long list of uh, um, standards. I don't want to bore you with standards because standards are by themselves a boring topic. I want just to give you, to leave you this, stand, this slide to make you possible, if you need, to see which are the standardization activity to try to have common approaches, safe and common approaches to this topic. Here are the international standardization organization standard for the um, power transfer, both AC and DC, the one we have seen before, and wireless, included automatic conductive power transfer. And this standard that is in progress in terms of preparation is the standard that can make at least for who want to follow ISO, uh, define the rules, the technical rules, safety rules in particular for all the typologies. You see here, for instance, for cars, for big trucks, this is conductive, this is wireless. And there are also the same for the two, three, four wheelers, in particular for the motor, motor cycles. There are standards that are the application of that for the purpose. There are a lot of, in this case, I see uh, international technical committee standards for the charging from the grid side, for the infrastructure side. I want to bore you with all of that, but you have the reference if you need. This is only for conductive charging, these two pages, for cars and trucks uh, and buses here. Again, uh, also the part regarding the needs at, at home of that. There, is, there are standards for connectors. You have seen before the um, type one example in your first video. This one was that connector. It is typical American China Japanese solution. And the CHAdeMO, CHAdeMO is DC fast charge. It is another standard here not represented. On the contrary, you, you see the so-called CCS, the combined. ACDC we use in Europe and we use in US. This, for instance, is a safe connector to recharge two, three, four wheelers, uh, avoiding the classical socket plug we are used to apply like a computer that is not 100% safe. Same is for wireless. You have here also the same for wireless. And here, very important, all the chapter of the communication already mentioned in the previous presentation. Here is the big standard, the 15118 for the communication vehicle to uh, infrastructure, this step, but be aware, unlikely to make the business winning, uh, make the charger speak with the cars is not enough. You need also other standards, here two of them are mentioned, to make possible the communication between the physical charging place and the charging system operator and the charging system operator and the e-mobility service provider, because to manage all this complexity together, that's the level we have to reach. M very new standard of this one. These are the standard dealing with the bidirectionality, the chance I mentioned you before to make the vehicle part of the grid. And these are standard, again, under preparation, trying to address this very important part in a safe and effective way, making a winning model for all the player of this long chain. Last slide, sorry, I meant late, but I try to be short, are devoted to the swapping. Swapping means uh, instead of waiting the time to recharge the battery, I remove the battery depleted and I put in the vehicle the battery already charged, assuming the charging at this point can be done in parallel, not affecting the, uh, the, store, the, the time in which the vehicle is not usable. Uh, swapping is not new. Here is an example from 50 years ago by Mercedes. In the field of cars and big buses, there has been a lot of trial, one very large by, for instance, better place, not successful. 
today who is starting to make a real large volume also for cars in automated way is NIO, China company, Chinese company. But here is another word. NIO is making everything, is making the vehicle, the battery, the infrastructure. In the Chinese environment, has different rules by, for instance, the European. While, and again, the previous presentation was very effective on that, this technology can be easily applied today on smaller vehicles because this is lighter, this is smaller, this is low voltage. So you can do the replacement by your end. And in this field, the big players of motorbike, Yamaha, Suzuki, Piaggio, are making standard by themselves to define common shape and characteristic of this battery to make them swappable between different um, solutions. And that can become another good way to avoid to stay waiting because the battery are charged while you are moving the vehicle and you take only the already charged battery. These are the standard for that. Last slide, if I remember correctly, don't forget, if you want to look at the future, that someone is exploring also the chance to charge the vehicle in motion, so reducing largely the power, both in this view, so cabling, it becomes like a big tramway, and by the ground. This is more research oriented, but another option is to have the coil in the road and the vehicle moving on the road, taking the electricity by the road. For who has to invest and decide which is the future of the infrastructure, this complexity has to be considered to make the wise choices. Thank you, and sorry for the three minutes too late presentation we did. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Vittorio. That's uh, totally no, no issues at all. Um, it, it has been a very informative uh, presentation from you. You've started in terms of giving us uh, insights in terms of the, the actualities, in terms of the risks on the ground. You've talked about the different approaches on how these can be addressed in terms of uh, different charging modalities, in terms of looking at systems integration. Um, the other factors that uh, uh, um, related to, for example, the positioning, you've uh, given us a picture of what might be possible uh, in the future, and um, you've uh, given us a, a run through of the different standards. So thank you very much uh, for those insights. Um, I would encourage everyone, if you have uh, any questions to Vittorio, you can uh, chat uh, them in the chat box or uh, give us uh, or raise your hands. Um, but maybe one question, um, essentially, um, Vittorio, from, from my end, uh, considering the state, for example, of the Philippines in terms of um, the current you know, um, EV developments that are focusing, uh, we've ha we have a lot of uh, proliferations in terms of small, light electric vehicles, as well as you know, electrification of uh, some of the public transport vehicles, the minibuses that we have. Um, which and we are in, in the, the country is in the process of uh, coming up with the, the EV bill that's also looking into charging infrastructure. Um, in terms of like the standards that you've presented, um, what's your main recommendation in terms of the the key ones that you know um, we can consider in terms of um, importance and in terms of urgency that uh, the very start like uh, these are the ones that we need to look into put in place as early as possible. Yeah, um, in my opinion, for the smallest vehicle, two, three, four wheelers, what we call in our field the L category, so less than a small car, let me say. Uh, in general, there is a good starting point. The energy on board requested is largely less. Sometimes the voltage is very low. The power to be used to the charging is not so high. And that, as said before, is not the solution, but put you in a good position to start the process. There are a few standards of the one I mentioned, you find in the slide, that yeah. are the safety and uh, um, mode of charging for this type of vehicle. Uh, and I feel that following this, uh, you can have on top of the classical home charging that will be done with classical socket and plug, leaving the problem of the safety to the guys doing that. Uh, because in private environment, this is the trend up to when a fire will impact also the people living mm. close. And in this case, I don't know how much private will be, but this is a side problem. Hopefully people will be wise in doing that. But in public area, this help to have also for this small vehicle, a safe and easy way to charge. So these are the first. Other elements for this vehicle, very relevant, 
can be the swapping. I suggest to take mm. care of the standard on the swapping because swapping in this segment seems to be, as the go-go experience tell us, something that is not asking for large infrastructure and complexity. And due to that can be done also at the end by the end user himself with a good, safe uh, approach. Uh, staying on what Corey has been saying in the first presentation that this swapping ask for design making this whopping fitting the replacement a lot of time without uh, damages of the system. Uh, other problem, totally different buses, because you have both. Uh, the first is the address with this, the second ask, uh, the more you want to use the bus uh, in the day, today ask for the CFAS charging. And for the CFAS charging, again, in the list, you find some safety standard for that. I feel in the short term will be conductive. Um, you know the experience also in uh, our European project uh, steered by IBB with Madrid of mm. fast charging the battery at the, the, the stop of the bus. In this case, uh, clearly this ask for a level of safety higher. There we speak about very high power, very high energy and people that is coming in out of the bus while the charging is in progress. And for that, there are some standard addressing specifically on the list of this, this topic. So for the smallest, make safe a also public cable-based low power charging and look at the swapping. For the biggest, this is fast charging. These are the two main directions we suggest to take care of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for this. Another so, element so... just to complete, uh, for mm -hmm. instance, yeah. Madrid experience, uh, they are, imagine to make higher DC fast charging in the um, let me say, place where the bus are recovered in the night. Uh, and they mm. realize that the bus asks for this infrastructure early morning, early night, and they want to open this infrastructure during the day, also to taxi driver. So another interesting uh, element for who has to manage the infrastructure and leverage the investment is to try to understand if different end user can complementarily use the same infrastructure to make his uh, cost better uh, exploited in terms of usage and effectiveness for the community. Thank you. I received a question here that was chatted to me. If you can very quickly uh, address this. For the adoption of the priority standards that uh, were flashed, um, can you give some insights in terms of uh, the needs for a huge or costly uh, infrastructure equipment to conduct the testing or checking of these uh, standards in general? Or, um, or in general, do adop the adoption of these standards require uh, costly testing uh, infrastructure and equipment, essentially? In general, at least in uh, Europe, US, uh, China too, the approach is the following. What you need to put in place uh, a component uh, is a homologation process uh, or certification mm -hmm. process, depending if it is a car, if it is a computer, what it is. In Europe, we have a process to certify this component, but there is in all the world in each region. And this is what mm -hmm. you have to be compliant for the law side. Uh, in general, these re regulations, these uh, certification processes, in the technical check of our, to verify if the device is compliant or not, use the standards. So standards have to be intended as technical neutral document are written by different players that are competitors. It's, it's not, let me say, a matter of competition, it's a matter to have together a common background mm. to do the right things. And they are applied in the homologation certification processes. So to understand the cost is probably a matter to understand, and that's a region is country-based, in your country, which are the rules uh, to be uh, satisfied to, for instance, install uh, an infrastructure and verify all the steps. In case, at least our experience in Europe, in case you want to make a big DC fast charger, is a multiple process. You need uh, someone to certify the safety of the electricity reaching the place, another one verify the connection of that with the DC fast charger, a third one verify that the fast charger is in line with the, the rules of safety and so on. And this depends mm. on the local uh, basis. Clearly, mm. higher the power and the voltage, more complex are also the instrument to make the test. That's out of discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Vittorio. I think uh, you've uh, provided us with uh, very uh, useful insights. Uh, we would be having a presentation from Dr. Uh, Manny Biona, who's uh, um, an expert in the area of uh, sustainable mobility, environmental modeling, 
um, energy modeling electric vehicles and smart mobility. He's currently the executive director of the Electric Vehicle Association of the Philippines and professor of mechanical engineering and executive dean of the Enrique Razon uh, Junior Logistics Institute of De La Salle University. Um, he's also a technology advisor for Tojo Motors, um, the, 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 the innovator that we are also working with in the Solutions Plus project. And we are uh, delighted to have him here uh, today to present on the, uh, the EV charging in the uh, context of the Philippines. So, Doc Manny, uh, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Alvin. Did, thank, do you, you thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Lama talk. Okay. Floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe before I, I start with my presentation, I'h uh, just like to give some points, uh, so some comments on the questions that you've asked earlier to uh, to to Vittorio, just an update update also for everyone. So Philippines basically have uh, through the Bureau of Product Standards have already uh, adopted the, most of the standards on charging and also on uh, on energy storage. But the thing is, uh, standards is different from regulations. So uh, if we're talking about standards, we have them, but we have not yet adopted them into a mm -hmm. regulation. And uh, I think you also asked the right question, uh, if you have the facilities. So right now, we don't have the facilities to do the testing. And uh, uh, the OSU is, is very much willing to, 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 to look at a possibility, for example, of setting up those facilities, but it's important that they are viable. So, but uh, look, looking at the, the, the local industry, um, if you're looking at uh, type approval, then the demand may not be that big. So uh, yeah, so we thought of okay, let's try to see if we can do if we can expand this to also okay, do do conformance conformance of production, and maybe that's when we have some economies of scale. Yeah, but anyway, um, uh, that that is just a segue for my talk. Okay, yeah. So I'll be talking about charging standards. Uh, then I'll be focusing more on EGPs and e trikes. So I think that's the that's the interest of most of the. Uh, most of the participants in this afternoon sessions. session. And then yeah. after that, we're gonna look at charging economics, uh, who's charged in what way, and um, what we think, what's gonna happen in the future for, e for EGPs and E-TREX, and then uh, some key points. Yeah, so um, we, we have uh, after what we call the three levels of charging. So we have level one, level two, and then we have level three. Um, the the uh, charge rate increases depending on the level. So, for example, for level one, that's just for one to two kilo kilowatts. Okay, that is this is normally the charges that you use for your uh, electric uh, electric bicycles, and also for for those of you who are uh, using uh, the the mini scooters, the the personal electric scooters. That's that is normally the type of charger that you use. And then we have the level two chargers around uh, three to twenty kilowatts. So um, some some of the some of the uh, electric tricycles that you see on the ground uh, charge at this rate, um, and some bigger vehicles also charge at this rate. And um, yeah, the third level is uh, if you would look at the the power uh, ratings there, the charge rates is they're, they're quite high. So when you say fast chargers, we're basically looking at level three uh, level three chargers. So what charger you're going to use? It depends on a lot of factors. Uh, but of course, the main the main factor is uh, okay, what's what's your battery? What's the what what is the capability of battery? So that basically defines the charger that we're gonna use. Then others would be more on would be more on operations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there has always been a talk on what standards Philippines should should adapt. So uh, there is right now uh, Shademo, then CCS, and then GBT, and then of course we have the Tesla. But uh, for for this afternoon's uh, discussions, I would like first to set aside Tesla. Um, yeah, so there's a, uh, there's a, there are ongoing talks right now, and uh, not only talks, but also uh, local studies looking at uh, okay, what standard, what charging standard should Philippines uh, pursue. Um, so, but, but the, fir the first question is, uh, why not just adopt any of this, or, or why not just adopt all? Well, uh, adopting, okay, there, there are several uh, key considerations. Number one, um, having a multi-platform charging system co costs more than having a single platform uh, charging system. So, and uh, considering that we're just starting everything, um, we, we're in a start where in, okay, you invest in a charging point, but the question is where's your market? So, so it's the cost, the cost component is very important. That's why there's a lot of uh, charging service providers right now that's uh, that, that is advocating that Philippines finally decide what charging system to use. 
But on the other hand, uh, adopting a single charging system okay, in, in, in a, in a, um, in, 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 a, in a country like Philippines wherein there's not much electric vehicles yet, okay, might also, on the other hand, limit the, uh, the type of vehicles that we can adopt. So for example, if you adopt Shademo, then, okay, so electric, electric vehicles such as this running on CCS and GBT may, 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 not, be, may not be supported. So, so there, there, there is right now this, uh, this, uh, okay, this ongoing talks. And uh, there are there are two road mapping projects that's ongoing. One's funded by World Bank, and then one is uh, funded by the Department of Energy. And both of these studies will be, uh, both of this funding will be looking at uh, yeah, looking at this uh, this issue. Um, for some countries like Thailand, they decided to adopt CCS, but for some countries like for example uh, like like uh, India, they they decided to just accredit. <coughs> Charging standards and let the market uh, uh, define um, define define what what's what standard to to uh, to adopt. Yeah. So so um, um, the local condition is very much different. So we have to look at our own case and then decide for for ourselves uh, eventually. But of course, it helps also looking at what's happening in other countries. Yeah, a, a closer look at GPs. If you look at uh, the different electric GPs that are offered in the market. So we have in most, all of them are now running in the lithium, uh, lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries. Uh, so we have in here the more common models, the GETS, the Leguider, Star 8, uh, then the, the, the Toshio Motors um, units. So we have there the voltage ratings, okay, the battery capacities, and uh, we will see in here, this, there, the second of the, you know, the second of the last column, uh, the type of chargers that you're, they're using. So basically, except for GETS, which uh, could charge as high as 40 kilowatts, okay, most of these vehicles charge at either level one or, or level two. And some of them could be charged in either, either, either way. Yeah. And um, okay, right now, most of these vehicles uh, charge, uh, charge using uh, direct charging on the vehicle, while, while the units of Tocho Motors uh, that's a uh, battery uh, battery swapping. Well, and, and the battery swapping thing allows Tojo Motors to bring down the size of their batteries. Um, vehicle charging, direct vehicle charging, and battery uh, battery swapping provides uh, have their own advantages and um, and 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 disadvantages. And I'll gonna talk more about that uh, in in the next slides. Okay. So we have now in here. Uh, the, um, the a list of the electric tricycles that are being offered in the in the market. So most of them are charged directly to the to the AC plug. Um, but there, there are now a couple of the of the vehicles that do the do battery uh, battery swapping. Um, this could be uh, attributed to how these vehicles operate. So normally they don't really go far. So so they just operate in an area. So that makes um, that makes battery swapping very, uh, very, very, very convenient. Okay. Now, so maybe the question is, uh, where do you save more? Do you do battery swapping or do you do, or do you do uh, direct uh, direct charging? If you do direct charging, then you need to be able to to charge your batteries fast. So, means you have to. To, to do some some sort of uh, some sort of fast charging, but let's first try to look at what are the cost differences okay, between the, the cost of the batteries that uh, can do fast charging and that can do uh, uh, slow charging. So I have listed down in here three types of batteries. LFP is lithium iron phosphate. LPTO is lithium polymer titanate oxide, and then LTO is lithium titanate oxide. I would want to um, bring your attention to the to the third column, maximum charge. Uh, maximum charge rate. So when you say 1C, it means that um, you can actually charge the battery in an R. Uh, to, you, can, you can charge it to full, to, to, full, at, at, to full levels in one R. When you say 4C, so if you charge a battery at, at that rate, then it means that you can bring down your charging time to 15 minutes. So, so the number there is basically something that you divide to, 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 to an R. So, 
So one over four is uh, sixty minutes. Over four is a uh, is fifteen uh, fifteen minutes. And if you do, if you you adopt the silicium titanate oxide, so tensi theoretically. Okay, I would like to emphasize the term theoretically because uh, okay, although theoretically you can charge it at this rate, normally that is not really uh, advisable. Um, then you can charge it at uh, sixty over ten of a over 10 of a of, of a minute so that is really uh, that is really fast so the question is why why don't we adopt these things uh that makes life that, that this, this this things would make life very convenient so by the way these are the maximum charge rate and on the left side you have the, the standard charge rate so this is what is recommended by the by the supplier but still for example at 2c that is 30 minutes then you get full charge that is quite fast so the question now is why don't we adopt lto or lpto for example why do we always uh, settle for lithium, uh, lithium um, iron uh, phosphate? Okay, on the far right, if you look at the battery cost per kilowatt R, so in here, I'm referring to the total amount of charge that may be contained by the battery throughout its life. So that means it's also a function of the cycle life. So by the way, when you say cycle life, it means it refers to the amount of times that you can charge discharge the battery. So say 6,000, you can charge your battery six thousand six thousand times times before it starts to it starts to to degrade. Ten thousand, ten thousand. Uh, you can charge it ten thousand times. Fifteen thousand means you can charge it fifteen thousand, fifteen thousand times. So if you take that into account, okay, then okay, we now have these figures. So battery cost per kilowatt hour. So for for uh, lithium uh, lithium iron phosphate is two point eighteen. The lithium polymer titanate oxide is 2.78. Lithium titanate oxide is oxide is 2.74. Okay, uh, they're they're a bit they're a bit um, more expensive, but uh, not that much, right? So still the question persists: Why do we continue to adopt um, lithium iron phosphate? Okay, as I've said earlier, okay, this this cost is a function of the light. So if you factor in that back and then co compute back the cost of the the cost of the batteries per kilowatt hour, then that's where now the problem comes. Um, lithium titanate oxide and lithium polymer titanate oxide, for example, could easily cost two to four times that of lithium iron phosphate. So that's where the issue is now. So that's why some of the vehicle suppliers resort to battery swapping. So you charge the battery at a slower rate, but of course we cannot afford the vehicles to be charged to be to be I, I, idle also at that at at the, at the, at, the, at, the, at the time that the vehicle uh, the, the batteries are charging, so we do so we do battery swapping. Now, let's now try to look at the service cost. So um, so we know that if you do slow charging, then um, you end up with a cheaper battery cost per kilowatt hour throughout the life of the vehicle. Okay, but if you look at service cost. It will actually cost you more to charge your battery, okay, using through through battery through battery swapping. So in here, this table assumes that for the lithium iron phosphate, you're charging it, you're charging that uh, that that electric tricycle through battery swapping. So that increases significantly your your cost. Um, and um, okay, doing 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 fast charging drastically reduces your, your cost. So, so why is that so? So if you look at, for example, okay, on, on the lower left, we have a graph comparing the different uh, um, scenarios. Let's first try to look at the two bar graphs. So we have the apex swapping and then, uh, no, not, not, first two, two, not the first two uh, graphs, the, the first and the third, because that is those are both uh, apex. We have their apex battery swapping, then we have their apex charging okay if you look at the uh, if you look at the, the figures okay, if you look at the figures um uh, doing direct charging is a lot cheaper okay however however if you look at the if you look at the black part because okay, that one refers to the labor okay um uh, and, and and what I mean is uh, we, 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 we can attribute that to the greater labor cost when you do battery swapping. 
Because just imagine you have to bring down the battery and then bring it back again. Uh, so that means you need more people to, to operate a battery swapping oper uh, battery swapping system compared to an e track depot charging. So if you have a deep e track depot charging, you, you bring your e track, e -track there, you just plug it, and then that's it. You don't need someone uh, someone to, to assist you actually compared to an e track swapping to an e track swapping um, system. Now you will see also in there that the uh, the swapping of a uh, of uh, EGP batteries are a lot cheaper compared to uh, e-trike uh, e trike swapping. Well, that could be attributed to to the to the the, the bigger the bigger capacity the, the bigger capacity uh, batteries of the, the of the of of um, of EGP swapping. Because note that this is per kilowatt hour. So keep you, you bring down the battery size, plug it, and then you charge it. Let's say uh, for for uh, uh, but, but to you charge it up to to say 15 kilowatt hour and compare that as if for e-track when you charge it only to around four kilowatt hour so same amount of labor same amount of effort okay but okay this time you're charging it at, uh, at, a, at, at a greater at a greater uh, uh, amount of uh, amount of uh, amount of energy so so eventually when you compute then the cost the cost uh goes down. Now, uh, what happens if you do now e-cheap depot charging? So if you look at the, fig the, the, okay, the, the figure now, the cost goes down further. But if you do e-cheap depot charging, it means um, you're, you're going to do it using fast charging. So and fast chargers have cost more than uh, cost more than ordinary uh, than ordinary, ordinary chargers. But of course, you bring down now the uh, to bring down now the labor uh, the labor cost and um, also for for uh, for uh, and okay so those are if you operate your own your own uh, charging systems so what happens if a third party invests on the charging system um but but maybe we first first ask a question so why, why let a third party do it okay first uh, if you operate your own charging system you have a fleet that means that you're willing to invest on it and in some cases, it also costs a lot. So that's why in some cases, it might it would be more convenient to let a third party, let's say a gasoline station, operate a, a charging system, and then you just plug it, you, you plug your vehicle there. So which means then that you have to be running at, um, using fast charging batteries. So in that case, um, okay, you will, you'll end up with this figure. It's a bit higher because... Um, then whoever invests on that on that system would have to also to earn. So yeah, so that's where now the profit comes in. So that's why you have the your light the light blue in there for for uh for profit. So so again, uh, why why still use battery swap? Higher cost of fast charging batteries, and in some cases, um, because supplier financial limitations. Why? Because normally what, what, what happens here is, um, I, I don't know if there are some uh, some uh, jeepney, electric jeepney operators in here, in, in this group. Okay, normally, um, the vehicle supplier co-invest okay, in, on, on, on the second battery. And uh, co-invest co, co on the vehicles. And um, okay, fast charging bat batteries are just very, very expensive. So, so uh, and the uh, vehicle suppliers also have limitations. And also very limited operator financial capacity, lack of battery monitor and tracking system, lack of fast charging network, and then technology um, inertia. So we know that okay, it's better to do direct charging, fast charging. It's more convenient. But the question is, do you have the funds to, to invest upfront? So that's why okay, people see uh, a, a, lot, a lot of operations still uh, depend on, on, on battery swapping. Now let's try to look at some business models okay, that is applied right now in, in the market. So I'm just talking about electric cheapness and electric bicycles. Uh, we, we can break the, the whole value chain of electric cheapness or electric bicycle operation into, into, into five. First, we have your manufacturing uh, supply. You have the battery leasing. 
Uh, you have the vehicle financial leasing, you have the battery swapping vehicle and charging services and fleet uh, operators. You would observe that I separated the battery side because you can actually just buy a, a unit without the battery gen, uh, without the battery gen, just lease the battery. So you buy it at a, at a, at a lower initial cost. So let's see uh, who handles what component. So for business model one, you have the manufacturer, P1. And then the battery leasing is either provided by P1, also the manufacturer, or it is invested on, the batteries are invested on by the fleet uh, operate, operators. But in most cases, the batteries are co-invested by both. So when the fleet operator buys the unit, it, it, the, the operator buys one set and the other set is being invested on by the, by the supplier and then, and then have it rented by the, by the operator. And then who funds now the, who funds now the purchase of the vehicle? Okay, so we know for, for, uh, for electric jeepneys, uh, there's an option to get a loan from land bank okay, or, or DBP, but we also know that uh, those loan requires equity. And in a lot of cases, cooperatives don't have the capacity to, uh, to provide this equity. So that's why also in a lot of cases, the vehicle supplier um, handles that equity. So, so what happens now, the fleet operator gets a loan from the vehicle supplier for the equity and it gets a loan from the bank. So that's why you have P2 and P1 in there. P2 is the bank, P1 is the, is the, vehicle, uh, is the vehicle supplier. Then you have the battery swapping or vehicle charging services. So, so who invests on that? So it's possible that uh, if the fleet operator don't have the capacity to invest on the charging services or you know, the battery swapping uh, uh, services, then it's the vehicle supplier that invests on it. But if it, the fleet operator is able, then the, it's the fleet uh, operator that invests on it. Or in some cases, they do a joint venture. Like the one, for example, in Jensen, it's a, it's a joint venture between Tojo Motors and the local cooperative in, in Jensen. And uh, that joint venture was also further uh, uh, supported by, by the local government. For business model two, this is a case where in uh, the uh, fleet operator uh, don't have the capacity to go invest in the battery leasing, in, in, in the battery. So it means that those bat so if you do battery swapping, then you need to have at least two batteries. So in this case, both batteries are invested on by the by the supplier. So the the op, uh, fleet operator basically just buy the uh, just buy the um, the the unit through a loan. And uh, this is similarly also with, with, the, with the previous one, a financing could be provided part could be partly provided by the by the supplier uh, or or and the and and the bank for business um the model um. Number three, this is a case wherein the uh, fleet operator is able to invest on the on on, on all of the batteries. So 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 you, so you, you have that case in there for for business uh, a model number four. Okay, this is a case wherein um, uh, the uh, fleet operator have a very minimal capacity to invest on, on anything. So everything is being invested on by the, by the manufacturer, which also serves as a battery leasing uh, uh, provider and also self-finance the, uh, self the, the vehicle and, and they have the, and also the charging uh, operations. And uh, earlier you heard GETS. So this is a model that uh, the, this, this is one of the uh, models that uh, gets uh, offered. They don't, don't have to invest on anything. You just pay for the use of the, uh, for the use of the vehicle. So GETS operates using model number four or model number six. Model, model number five, you have an investor, which also your fleet operator that invests on everything. And then you just have a manufacturer that supplies the, uh, the units. This is the, this is the model of Isakai. So uh, they, they get units from star eight. So star eight is P1, P2 is Isakai. Okay, they, they invest on the battery, they invest on the battery, they, 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 fund the, they fund the acquisition of the vehicle, they operate the charging system, then they, they also operate the, the, the vehicles themselves. Okay. So, um, so you would have now in there, 
the charging mode. So some of the operate some of the models operates using battery swapping. Some of the models oper operates on a, on a, on fast charging or 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 direct charging, and it's strongly related with the capacity to invest. So so it's the invest is the capability of the different players that impair that dictates eventually what mode of charging is a. Uh, is adapted and what type of batteries are also used. Uh, if you look at uh, the cost breakdown of, uh, of electric chippies, um, in normally the main problem of electric, in the long run you earn, you have there the financial net present value, so it's very positive. But the main issue is the initial cost. You have the investment cost. So, so if we're, if we're able to remove that investment cost, that, that cost difference, then we can say that electric chippies could now be, could now be uh, competitive. So how do, we, uh, how do we do that? That's where you know, policy to come in to facilitate this business model. So if you look at uh, business model number seven, you have the manufacturer that takes care of its own business. It does not have to, to co -co invest on any, of the, on any of the other value chains. Because the, in, in the Philippines, electric de electric jeepney and electric classical manufacturers are small SMEs and also have funding limitations. Then you have a third party um, providing the leasing of the batteries. And then you have the, a, a financing, a government financing program that won't require equity because that's the main problem of fleet operators or cooperatives. And that's only possible, for example, if the government guarantees the loan. Um, and then you have a vehicle charging services that could be either operated by the battery leasing company or, or a third party P4. And then you have the fleet operator that just focuses on operating the, on operating the units. So it, in this business model could allow now, you, you can now adopt a fast charging with this business model we're in the operator just buys the uh, gets a loan to buy the unit without the batteries, and then since you have a third party investing on the batteries, um, then cost could no longer, and then and the, that third party has the capacity to to do the investments, then uh, cost of the of the batteries, the initial cost of batteries may not be an issue, because that that third party is a uh, is able uh, is able uh, financially. So you know address the issue of um, initial in, uh, in, of, of investment uh, differences uh, at, at the upfront. In fact, you get, you're able to get your vehicles, at some electric vehicles as a, as a much cheaper rate. Then you do battery leasing. So that is being invested on by P2. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, so uh, by, by tweaking who invests on what, then electric GPs now could could be could be attractive. We can also adopt a similar concept for for electric uh, electric bicycles. Okay, the electric bicycles uh, right now would cost you around three hundred fifty thousand. Okay, uh, the battery would cost you around seventy thousand. So removing seventy thousand from from three hundred fifty thousand that brings down the cost of the vehicle to to two hundred eighty thousand. And how much are are the budget? Uh, Maxima zero right now. They cost around two hundred twenty-one thousand. So, the difference is not that big uh, anymore. So that is possible if there is a third-party battery leasing li leasing company. But of course, that also means that uh, we might have to standardize the, our batteries, the, the voltages of the of our of our e trikes and yeah. So that's that's where now also uh, some policy intervention needs to needs to come in because. Uh, a third-party battery leasing company would also in, would only invest if uh, there is an economy of scale. And to get economies of scale, then their batteries should be adaptable to to most of the vehicles that are running on the running on the ground. So, so key right. points: fast charging is more economically preferred. Financial and technical people use of the vehicles of foreign operator dictates charging strategy in, in EGPs and in bicycles. And the right business model could be. Um, to, to sway the, um, um, the, the, the top up mode to a fast charging and the battery cost reduction, mass demand generation, and charging standards are the enablers. Thank you. Shure Cheng, uh, who is uh, currently serving as an assistant professor at the Department of Transportation and Communication Management Science, National Chengkung University, Tainan, in Taiwan. 
Um, he used to serve as the head of the sustainable mobility uh, of the uh, World Secretariat of ECLE. Um, and he also had uh, his uh, academic degrees from the Center for Transport Studies at the University College London in the UK, as well as um, a PhD in tra Transport Studies, MSc in City Design and Resilience. Um, so, uh, Chure, can you hear us? Uh, Chure will be uh, providing us insights and experiences in terms of charging infrastructure deployment experiences in Taiwan. Um, Chure? A big thank you to Premier Asia and um, Oaktown Suite on behalf of the Solutions Plus uh, for this wonderful opportunity to share some information and experience about the charging infrastructure deployment experience from Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in the next, I think, 20 minutes, I'll be um, trying to go through these a few topics, and especially in the next slide, you can see very well. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, I think this is not, not, not similar to many of you, just because I think uh, countries in Southeast Asia, I think we all share the same kind of movement or uh, sort of travel behaviors. And particularly in, in Taiwan, I think um, we call it scooters. I think it's also called a moped or um, also two wheelers in many parts of the world. But somehow it's not just a, a form of transport, a mode of transport. It, it's, it's a business model, it's used for logistics, and it's a family car, and it's a fashion icon, as you can see here. It's multifunctional, multi purpose. Um, but that creates, has been creating a lot of problems especially from this uh, model split in Taiwan, as you can see that a scooter is the main mode of, almost the main of mode of transport, accounts for 45.2% of the trips taken overall, uh, followed by private vehicles. So electrifying scooters has become, uh, I would say on top of the agenda for a really long time and the Chinese government actually has been thinking about that, but then in the next few slides, I'll be talking through a few setbacks and the reason why it's not really happening as is expected. Next slide, please. So given the amount of um, scooters on the streets, um, 20, 12 points, uh, almost like 12 to 30% of the uh, national total emissions actually comes from uh, the uh, transport sectors and the road transport because of Taiwan is sort of an, an island itself and the major mode of transport is definitely road transport uh, as domestic, major domestic way of moving around. So 95.57% uh, of the uh, transport emissions comes from the road transport. So decarbonizing the transport sector, especially the road transport sector is paramount in Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. And as you can see here, the, the number of private vehicles, the number of scooters, uh, despite an early kind of success in, 20, in 2013, 14, you can see there's a gradual increase in the past few years. And the number of cars and scooters owned by a hundred population has never been uh, going down um, anywhere. And so you can see that the number is not really um, changing too much in terms of uh, decarbonizing the transport or to, to shifting from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, the reason that it's, it's I mean, I'm, I'm coming from more like a governance and policy perspective. I think there are, um, I, I have been in the, in the uh, past two hours, I think I've been blown away by all the um, knowledge and information about uh, the electric vehicles, the batteries. I think I've learned a lot as well. And what I can possibly contribute to the conversation or the exchange here is, is from a, a policy and governance perspective. Um, so I think back in, in time, back in 2017, um, the national government actually announced a few phase out policies um, to, to get fully, to, uh, to get the government fleets and also scooters and cars uh, fully electrified in 2030, 2035 and 2040. I think that was, uh, definitely a good suggestion and there was a good intention. That was a, a really visionary decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so 
could you go back to the slide please yeah so it's announced in 2017 but you turn in 2019 as we called um in taiwan is a hairpin pen and it's a really technical term for any um u-turn any reverse policy reversal is called hairpin turn um for many reasons because of the change of the government and because of the change of the role of a few political figureheads they've decided not to um press on the uh, decarbonization or uh, electrification of vehicles uh, for the fear that there might be policy, other policymakers or stakeholders that would be uh, affected by the uh, drastic improvement or drastic development of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. So I think alongside this so-called hairpin, um, hairpin turn, I think the subsidy program have not been really helpful. Um, I think initially in 2017, 2018, uh, there were a few really uh, progressive e-mobility subsidy programs uh, for private cars and scooters. However, I think because of the pressure from other stakeholders, in particular the IC industry and also the conventional scooter um, supply chain, uh, the, the government took a different approach as to uh, subsidizing um subsidizing the the gas the gasoline power scooters along with or in this in parallel to electric scooters in 2020 and 2021 as you can see on the right hand side that there was uh actually a surge of the sale of gasoline power scooters in 20 uh starting from 2020 like you see there is actually a decreasing trend uh, in 2017 2018 that people tend to uh, jump on the back wagon of the subsidy program to get uh, the new scooters as clean as possible. However, I think this, the subsidy program actually has hampered that goodwill, that good policy. And that's why I think the uptake of electric scooters and electric vehicles is relatively slow still in Taiwan. The next slide, please. So the authority, I think, have learned the, hard, the lesson the hard way from 2019, 2020, 2021, and now they um, have gone all out to set forth a few uh, plans in the future by um, sort of pan out the future, the subsidies program for both vehicles and charging facilities, and to update their building regulations and fire safety regulations and to align all the standardization, installation, and maintenance guidelines and case books, and then to release the parking lots or public uh, properties for the possibility of installing charging position, charging poles and stations in public properties. And here, I think you can see that the role of national agencies is quite, uh, I, I mean, I mean silo-ish, uh, simply because uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs is put in charge of anything about industry, about standardization, environmental protection, is put in charge to subsidize the, uh, the electric vehicles and charging facilities, interiors, uh, Ministry of the Interior is in charge of building codes and fire safety regulation. And it's, it's, I think you could tell, like, for the national government, it's all about regulatory frameworks, policy frameworks. Next slide, please. However, I think when it has to happen now at the local level, because however many subsidies programs we have, however uh, many uh, sort of regulations, guidebooks, guidelines, and case studies we have at the national level, things have to happen on the ground. So there are a few cities that are relatively uh, keen on uh, taking up the challenge to electrify their scooters and also vehicles in their jurisdictions, and such is the case I uh, would like to share here is uh, some sort of the strategies and action plans um, taken by the Taichung city government. They have these public sector leads the way, private sector follows up approach for the public sector to send out the good signal, uh, the clear signal for the private sector to chip in and to do the collaboration with the public sector. Um, in terms of the charging spots, stakeholder engagement, a battery swapping system, and charging facility subsidies. Next slide, please. So the way I have been categorizing this particular slide, interestingly, I would say is to not from the policy regulatory framework, but it's all based on the actions and the strategies, because it's how local governments use to communicate with the stakeholders. 
they set forth the regulations very clearly, um, such as the existing national policies and that how they could use the low emission city ordinance to override things that are still lacking at the national level, such as the extra subsidies program and to bring in extra stakeholders. And space-wise, we all know that charging stations need or any charging poles need some extra space. Whether or not it's a good idea, that's another story for another day. But in city center, I think very proudly populated or densely populated areas such as cities in Taiwan, find space for, for charging facilities uh, has always been very challenging. So all local government agencies chip in to, uh, to find that available spaces for the transformation of the uh, electrification of the, uh, the vehicles or the infrastructures as well. So here we see the parking, uh, public parking facilities are uh, biracial transformed into charging facilities or charging spaces. They also encourage the, uh, the private business premises or public, um, I would say, the uh, housing complex to set up their own community and to provide charging facilities for their employees, for residents, and um, possibly can open their charging facilities to the public. And incentives wise, I think, along with uh, the subsidies program from the national government, local governments also um, have established or um, pan out a few incentives to encourage public sectors to install charging stations and also to encourage the installation of uh, charging spots in housing complexes by relaxing, loosen, loosening up the building codes and regulations. The next slide, please. So, if I may spare just a few uh, minutes to explain this, I think. Um, even though I would say um, the electrification of vehicles in Taiwan has never been a smooth sail, and we are learning the correct way, the hard way, I think uh, there was a bit of a setback frustration for a few years, but we are uh, ramping up and we are scaling up the strategies. So uh, what I am sharing right now is not really set in stone yet because um, they're still doing by learning, but somehow I think here, the EV charging station operations were put in the center stage. It's very important because uh, they do have the technologies and they understand the policies, they understand the customers and the EV makers. So they are uh, they are the putting the driver's seat um, to collaborate on the left hand side, the public tenders, business owners, even self feed stations and uh, individuals, public fleets, also public developers, how they can actually work in collaboration with the EV marker uh, makers to provide information about charging uh, information and with the e EV owners to streamline the software, the app to make payment easily to make information more available and more accurate and to give that confidence to release and to relieve the range of anxiety and charging anxieties to the EV owners, I think which is quite key. Um, and then they collaborate with the public charging spots through subsidies and through the uh, uh, sort of public-private partnership. So on the right-hand side, I think it, it's, it's, the, it's taking shape. I think the collaboration is taking shape and with the foundation in place, and they could go out actually now to help all the stakeholders on the left-hand side, in yellow boxes, and to set up either through providing spaces or electrification for the charging operators to come in and to set up the uh, technical uh, infrastructure or they get the direct subcontract uh, from individuals, police or government agencies, so on and so forth. The next slide, please. Yeah, I think uh, this is the last slide I would like to share uh, in the interest of time. I think, I think there are still a few issues that need to be resolved urgently, as you can see quite clearly in the first few slides that it's just very silo-minded. We have different agencies at the national level to deal with different subsidies, regulations, guidebooks, codes of conduct, and everything. So, for a operator, for a uh, infrastructure infrastructure provider, I think that's really hard for them to understand which document to send to which department or which government agency. So, there's a horizontal integration confusion. I I would say still in place right now. At the national level and that also 
brings up it has actually been bringing up another question as to it looks like the the Ministry of Economic Affairs is taking charge of the electrification of vehicles in terms of and not only the vehicles itself but also the charging facility per se but which ministry actually is also in charge of decarbonizing uh, decarbonization of transport which is supposed to be the Ministry of Transportation and Communication but they seem to take a back seat. They are not really being proactive and they have been criticized by the public, by the media. Um, so I think that's something at the national level they need to sort out quite quickly because uh, Taiwan does now also have this net zero emission, uh, net, zero, yeah, net, zero, net zero 2050 uh, declaration um, who is in charge of what the, um, I would say the um, liability is becoming um, more uh, important than ever before. Also, also vertical, the vertical integration has been confusing given the fact that there are subsidies programs from national government, but also from the local governments, whereas um, the government agencies uh, at the national governments don't really align their policy with the national, uh, the government agencies at the local level. And for even for the same type of subsidies or the same type of um, tasks. And that also has been creating some confusions as well. And spaces and locations, I think um, uh, so far, most of the charging facilities are, uh, are designed in public parking spaces or uh, private parking spaces. And rarely were they so far designed around the curbside, around the on-street parking. And I think uh, also because like, it's a scarcity, right, for the urban parking areas, is especially in the city center. Um, whether that could be uh, used as an add-on to our current charging system, but also how uh, we could better understand the uh, the driver behaviors to so that we can install the right type of charging uh, poles at the right space without uh, wasting uh, the resources, wasting the uh, public money. And finally, I think. Um, policy varies between cities to cities in this early stage, even in Taiwan. Cities uh, that are the forerunners are putting together their resources, whereas uh, cities they are a little bit rural or regions are a little bit rural. They still have to look up to those cities to understand how they can mobilize their resources or even capacity. Some of their uh, employees don't really understand emergency that much. Um, last but not least, I think there is still a call for uh, some official guidelines, not just about technical case books and rule books, but also how the best in terms of the policy white paper and policy guidelines for cities in Taiwan to know who are the st stakeholders they need to bring to the table and how the best deploy uh, immobility. Uh, anything about the ecosystem without, uh, again, just repeating the mistakes the national governments uh, made back in 2019, 2020. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I think that's all. I hope I was not really overrunning, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suri. Uh, you've given us a very good overview in terms of the uh, vertical and uh, horizontal integration uh, approaches and challenges that are happening in Taiwan. And I think this are very much relatable to to our audience in the Philippines. Maybe one question uh, that uh, was chatted uh, to me as well. Uh, this is a very um, interesting question in terms of the, you mentioned that cities uh, currently, you know, are also doing, uh, let's say, city-specific policies, uh, approaches. Uh, do you see any challenges in terms of, um, you know, taking such um, quite city-specific approaches? Are there going to be tensions with regards to, do you see, or do you foresee tensions with regards to the, let's say, um, some of the national uh, regulations, for example, or are these uh, almost totally in line with what the, what the, uh, the, the ministries are, are putting in place? And are there specific mechanisms for dialogues um, as, where cities can also discuss um, and, and learn from each other in, 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 in your case? And if you can, you know, just provide us some insights on what you recommend in terms of like peer-to-peer um, um, -peer type of uh, discussions on this. Thank you. Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think tension-wise between 
uh, different levels of governance that um, say the, the building code is, is a very good example that the Ministry of Interior uh, announced a building code for basically the safety reason. I think one of the speakers mentioned early on about the challenges, how to, to make sure the charging points or charging facility safe. Um, yes, the national government stepped something around that, but how it's just very fundamental, very basic, but in reality in cities, there are different types of building styles and different kind of complex building complex. So uh, I think cities definitely didn't see that sufficient. They had to come up with something that fits their purposes, but there is always the gap saying, oh, the national government didn't really take into account this type of building into consideration. So there, I think a lot of back and forth and because local government didn't really want to make decision on their own to bury that liability. So there were a lot of meetings between national and local governments. And that's one thing they even had. Uh, that is more about peer-to-peer -peer exchange. The second point is that I think in light of these, I think earlier this year, maybe in, during the summertime in July, August, they had a meeting. All cities had, had a meeting together with the national government to talk about uh, how the best to install uh, charging poles in uh, parking garages and parking facilities. So they did a bit of an inventory check to see how many charging poles are there currently in private and public parking spaces and how many more they could achieve and what are the challenges that they talked about or uh, how the best to install on-street parking poles because some cities don't have the capacity and some cities do. So I think even though it's not really an official peer-to-peer -peer exchange, but they exchange the information through simply just the parking meeting, like, oh, how the best to improve the parking facility. And the conversation was actually all about installing the electricity, uh, installing the charging poles. Thank you very much, Ture. Uh, uh, I think uh, that's a very important point uh, the, to consider, at least in the case of the Philippines, uh, also in terms of elevating the, uh, the discussions uh, that involve also the local government units in terms of uh, uh, and, and their interaction in, in relation to what is being done at the ministerial level. Dr. Nuong Sulapuk, um, who would be presenting on the, uh, the case of uh, Thailand in terms of the rules of uh, government, in terms of EV charging development. Um, he currently leads the research in initiatives of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency at the National Energy Technology Center, or NTEC, and he's also the uh, project leader of the UNIP MTEC uh, project on mainstreaming electric mobility in Thailand. He has actively been involved in the promotion of electric vehicle development in the country, and served as a founding member of their uh, Electric Vehicle Association. Um, he has had this uh, um, a PhD degree on materials engineering um, with the uh, bioengineering minor from, uh, from MIT. And uh, we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Nuang. Uh, Nuang, can you hear us? Myself here. I just, okay, so I won't, within the interest of time, so I will just uh, go ahead to uh, a bit <clears throat> a thing that I just like to, uh, to introduce that I actually we have uh, just uh, last year the cabinet has approved all this uh, new uh, energy center within NASDAQ. So now I actually been working in MTech, you know, as we've seen uh, Alvin for a long time, but now I'm just changing the my my hat or my code to be uh, just MTech the, for the energy technology center. So a lot of the information here actually coming from uh, the fact that I also have been a, a founding committee of the Electric Vehicle Association of Thailand. I think I met uh, of course uh, Dr. Yun, uh, Yuna many times. I think many of the uh, uh, talk and also lecture around uh, this uh, interesting and exciting topic. So we in Thailand we actually have this uh, event uh, establishment since uh, 2018. We have been trying to actually uh, promoting the electric vehicle usage uh, in Thailand. And you can see that we have a lot of uh, I think members, both the individual as well as the corporate. And I think we try to be a linkage between the academic you know, and also the industry, both the SME in Thailand as well as the uh, big corporation from abroad. So with uh, our association, we just have uh, accurate information and also maybe some of the things that we could try to gather some of the characteristics and also the information 
uh, not specifically to any company, but also I think to to most of the uh, sector in the electrical supply chain in Thailand. Just a bit before moving to the EV itself, and it, I think uh, stage infrastructure just want to show you that I think this is a snapshot of the Thailand in the past, I think 20 years that we have been uh, growing and government is putting a lot of uh, 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 promotion and also policy to support the automotive industry in Thailand. You can see that since the crisis of Tom Yum Pung in 1997, so our auto industry has been, I think, climbing and supporting. You can see from 1998, 1999, up, 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 until we, I think we have a, a crisis here, around the hamburger crisis. And the interesting thing to see that every time we have a crisis, the government start to boost up the, the production and for the utilization of the, the, uh, of the vehicle. And one thing I want to point out to you is that uh, if you look at the two color here, the base is uh, uh, dark blue. This is actually the domestic sale. And also the lighter blue is actually for export. So you can see that uh, Thailand, we have been uh, promoting the auto industry for self-consumption until I think the, the year, we have almost a 20, 10, 10 years ago that we actually have a sector of the exporting more than 50 percent of our production in Thailand, and of course, you know, I think like other country with the COVID nineteen, then our production has dropped. So this is the status of the electric vehicle in Thailand. I think you can see that uh, actually this is, uh, we have this uh, information sharing on our association event website. You can check it for the regular update. So if you look at this chart, this is actually the accumulated uh, electric vehicle registration in Thailand. If you look in the left hand side here, we just date back about four or five years. So you can see that uh, the number of accumulated has been increasing. And uh, I think uh, we just uh, uh, only a few years ago where actually the, the underland transport has already uh, segregated the registration of the uh, EV into HEV and PHEV. Previously, uh, there is no differentiation between HEV and PHEV, but then after the, the year last year, then there are separate uh, classification for registration in, in this uh, DLT. The good thing about this is that uh, what, what we as a researcher can do is actually we can estimate the additional loading coming from the grid when we have this, uh, of course, electric vehicle uh, growing in Thailand. If you look on the right hand side here, of course, you can see that uh, there's a various kind of the vehicle that has been uh, uh, electrified in Thailand. You can see we have this is a full EV, you know, battery electric vehicle. This is a plug in hybrid. This is an HEV where we have no plug at all. You can see that <clears throat> if you look at the VEV here, we actually have a lot of motorcycle. I think this is a more than 50%. And this is why we actually uh, work in collaboration with UNEP on actually focusing on the the two two wheeler electric two wheeler here, and if you look into of the plug in hybrid and also this uh, hybrid vehicle, it actually is uh, become the the four uh, the sedan, and you can see here this sector for the BEV actually I would think about forty percent is actually been a growing level is coming from the four wheeler that's uh, coming from China because uh, we have this uh, free trade agreement where the import electric vehicle import from China has low tax. And if you look at the new registration, so this is actually also increasing, you know, for the past five years. And uh, since last year, we have a differentiation between the BEV, PHEV, and HEV here. So the twin is still the same. And if you look at the right hand side in the, in the uh, pie chart here, you can see that I think the BEV is still dominated by motorcycle, and then fifty percent, and then followed by the sedan here. So this is in uh, both English and Thai uh, letter here. Is it also the, the signal figure, the figure for the PHEV actually dominated by the, the four, four wheeler? This is because of the Department of Excite Tax has reduced the Excite Tax when the vehicle actually has some electrified unit or the plug-in hybrid in the case. Now, if you look into the uh, uh, tracking infrastructure in Thailand, you can see on the left hand side here, we have, uh, I think right now, this is the information we have uh, as of uh, August. We have about, I think, 600 something uh, uh, charging vehicle uh, infrastructure here. And you can see that uh, there are also change, uh, different uh, operator that actually coming to uh, play as a, uh, in terms of the, the service provider, ranging from a new, <coughs> new, new uh, 
new faces and as well as uh, some of the uh, old faces like PTT, which is a national oil company, uh, some of the electric uh, vehicle, I mean, some of the electricity authority generation of Thailand, like next year here, on this side, on the right hand side, yeah, this is uh, the, the main uh, electricity generator of Thailand, which is stated in the price. And sometimes we have this uh, MEA, or PA, which is also the transmission uh, of the electricity in Thailand as well. And this actually, we have also some SI uh, 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 electricity tariff, which are uh, actually uh, 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 cheaper than actually the electricity that used in the household. So that it could be something that to be incentive, incentive by the business for people who want to uh, make an investment in this uh, charging station business. And now I think also not only the, the, the electricity uh, company or the oil company that switching into the electricity, but the bank itself also find the opportunity here. You can see this is Siam Commercial Bank, one of the big banks in China, actually has a package that can allows uh, some of the, the 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 investor that could be able to. Uh, this why this of course in Thai, but it just say that you can actually invest uh, also uh, for this package that could actually also get a return in seven years. So, and I forgot to mention that if you look in the uh, infographic on the left hand side here, so we have, I think, about you know, 1,900 charging stations varying different between the AC or the normal charge or DC, as you can uh, see classified here. So, <clears throat> besides that, I think last year, 2020, I think the government has been uh, launching this, what we call the National Electric Vehicle Policy Committee and actually headed by the Deputy Prime Minister. So I think the, our representative from EVAT and also NASA has been a member of this uh, uh, big committee and also uh, there's a subcommittee, a working group. So there are actually four subcommittees that are trying to look at how Thailand could uh, promote this electric uh, vehicle industry. So we have, uh, for example, we have a promotion and manufacturing of the EV. And we have uh, the development of the infrastructure for the battery also. And we have the uh, impact assessment because I think Thailand has other uh, country in ASEAN as well. That if we have a lot of EV, which means that, of course, uh, our uh, fossil fuel will be used for less. But our fossil fuel in Thailand are actually have been, been blended with biofuel. So, for some ethanol and biofuel. So, we have to also be, be mindful that if we're promoting uh, EV, of course, it doesn't come like 100 now but in the future we must have some way for those uh, uh industry that has been established earlier especially in the biofuel uh actually i don't know where also the ev has been replacing the use of the gasoline so we have to check with that and last one is also the, looking at the supplement that promoting the ev research in that so this is actually the the thailand target that announced uh, uh, earlier uh, this year so we have we call it Z, set EV, which is zero electric vehicle. So by definition, the zero electric vehicle is uh, for BEV or fuel cell, uh, FCEV only, not including the HEV or PHEV. And these are actually the latest uh, target that the government has been put forth uh, in the news as a, as a, from the meeting from the National Electric Vehicle Policy Committee. You can see that the target is actually to have the 100% of the electric vehicle usage by the year 2035. To me, this is also very challenging. And of course, I think uh, government realized that and also trying to, I think, come up with many other packages and also some policy to ease this, uh, this uh, achievement. And this uh, electric vehicle uh, measure also has been part of the, 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 the implementation mechanism toward uh, Thailand carbon neutrality that has been uh, just uh, uh, announced last week as well in the uh, UK. So in the end, you can see that we can separate into the usage of the electric vehicle and also the production of electric vehicle. As I showed earlier that Thailand, we actually producing more than what we use in, in the country. So we are mainly targeting the production uh, for export as well. And we can also target for the passenger vehicle, motorcycle, motorcycle bus, which is a three-wheeler or, or uh, the trike like uh, in the Philippines, but also ship and also the rail. So this is some of the target that has been, I think, uh, circulated around the, the, the media. Now, if you focus more on the, I think, uh, uh, the cars in pickup, pickup is basically the light duty vehicle in Thailand, which is very popular. 
So these are the, some of the intermediate targets like 2022, 2025, 2030, and 2035. So this is just one of the things that you can see that uh, right now the government actually using, uh, focusing on this target uh, 20, 2030 to have a 30% production of the vehicle in Thailand to be uh, zero emission vehicle in Thailand. So in other words, we must reach about the 700.7 to 5 million uh, electric vehicle production in Thailand in the next, I, I guess, uh, six years. We'll see if we can achieve that. And also, I think not only the electric vehicle itself as a target, but uh, the government also launched this uh, target for infrastructure as well as a charging station. So you can see that uh, on the top here, which is a uh, accumulated charge, uh, pickup truck, and this is uh, the charging for you know for DC quick charge and also for the normal DC to invest onto the car target on the left figure on the left column, and also for the electric motorcycle, I think we have uh, accumulated the target here as you can see, and also the charger for the target, and I think uh, I will also touch upon the fact that not only the charging vehicle, a uh, charging station for for electric two wheeler, but also the battery swapping is also starting to appear. So I think as a some of the demonstration project in Thailand, and just recently last month, and we have this uh, uh said that I has been launched here uh, uh, two in, in Thailand. So here in the next four or five slide, I just want to show you some of the I think demonstration that has been uh, uh, you can see on the in the news regarding the focusing on the electric two wheeler. I think here this is uh, about two years ago. This is uh, coming from the, the one of the University Thammasat University, which is actually near my my office. And also with the company Star Eight, they have been launching this. Uh, I think the electric uh, two wheeler project within the the, the 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 university campus. So they are actually trying to 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 enhance the fact that they can use a sustainable transportation within the university. And also there are some of the swapping. Uh, option that has been tried uh, in, in the university as well. Another one this is actually coming from Thailand Post. I think this is uh, similar to I think the, the German, the Deutsche Post uh, in Germany that they are trying to uh, moving or replacing the fossil fuel vehicle by the electric vehicle. So in this case, Thailand Post also doing this project, uh, covering uh, the truck, uh, also the, the Four wheeler and also the electric two wheeler chair. So they actually because uh, they are for, uh, uh, working with the Bantu industry, which also uh, uh, a Thai company that has been uh, investing in the uh, in the coal mine industry. So you can see that even the coal company they are now also trying to diversify their portfolio, moving away from the conventional energy to the, the electric vehicle or the battery in the future. Then another one for DHL in Thailand, and DHL is uh, similar to uh, Thailand Post. They are also having this uh, uh, project that uh, launching this uh, uh, usage of the electric uh, two wheeler and also using this as to as a vehicle to to deploy the, the, the package to our the customer. So here they are also trying to use uh, this uh, 50, 50 electric motorcycle for delivery, and also they are trying to to have this. Uh, uh, I think the charging and swapping station here at the at the depot. So. And here, this is also another project called Winoni. And actually, this is just being playing by the word win in Thailand, which means that the rider that actually serving uh, electric uh, a two wheeler the two wheeler taxi, and me in Thailand mean that, so basically that the Winoni in Thai would mean that the rider or the the motorcycle taxi with our them. So this is a project actually launched by Bangja, which is another oil company in Thailand. They are trying to, I think, uh, also diversify the portfolio from just only fossil fuel refinery into the electric uh, motorcycle. And also they have this uh, electric project uh, that uh, working with the taxi driver, taxi rider in, in, in Bangkok here. So this is actually uh, one of our uh, previous uh, minister of higher education. They also uh, invite to be part of this uh, the project on the launching uh, last year. Also, this is another one coming from the ECAT, which is the electric electricity generating authority of Thailand. So th Thailand we still have this uh, uh, not a free market or the trading in electricity. We still have the enhanced single buyer, so we only have one. 
big uh, producer in Thailand, which is State Enterprise, which is Ecat. And this Ecat there, he also they are focusing on various types of vehicle, ranging from the motorcycle here, and also the boat. And also this is has been uh, some of the the diversified portfolio from Ecat that's trying to actually move away from from the fact that if in the future uh, there are people using less and less electricity regarding from the outfit and also from the self-consumption from consumer, then the ECAT will find a better business. And in this case, they are also uh, doing the, the some project on electrifying uh, transportation. And also, they also help in terms of the PM 2.5 uh, pollution that we see in that company as well. Now, <clears throat> the last topic that I want to touch upon is actually some of the work that I've been working uh, some of the work that uh, I've been collaborating with the UNEP. And this is actually working with the TC, also TC stands for the Thailand Industrial Standard Institute. For TC, they actually, uh, uh, the job is to, to launch the, the vehicle that, uh, I mean, not the vehicle, but the, the standard for various things, including the vehicle and also the electric vehicle. So you can see that in, by TC, there are two, stand, two uh, standard type. So they are also the voluntary and the mandatory. So for those, uh, uh, I think the industrial uh, good uh, application that may be uh, concerned of the safety for the public and the TC require a mandatory certification. But for, for example, but for electric uh, vehicle, especially uh, the one that we just, they have been launching uh, recently, they're still under the voluntary basis because they are not sure yet whether how the market will accept this uh, sanitization or requirement. So with this, so we have this uh, workshop earlier this year. Actually, it's a hybrid workshop because of the COVID. Then we we also uh, have been uh, uh, lucky to have uh, some of the uh, also presenter presenter from TC as well as uh, from UNEP. And for this one, TC has been I think at back since earlier this year launching the subcommittee to work toward the, the standard, the national standard on battery swapping. So basically, they are focusing on <coughs> the dimension, the voltage, the connector, and also the safety as a as a as a beginning of the, this uh, standardization. And previously, from last year, uh, this is has shown that we have the TC has been, I think, look at the international uh, 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 international standard for example ISO. So in this case, that we actually uh, translate and also uh, minor. Uh, slight modification of the, some of the, of the content to be suitable for the local environment. So for this uh, uh, TISI 3105, which is actually dealing for the performance of the moped and motorcycle, there has been looking at the two parts. The part one is also similar to the ISO 13064 on the reference energy consumption and range as well as the board operating and characteristics. So this has been I think, uh, announced as a national standard already uh, last year. And this year, they just, uh, I think just last, last month, we just have approval from the board of the TC that uh, now we have this new uh, standard that uh, call the electric moped and motorcycle, especially on the removal, rechargeable electric energy storage system. So as I shown in the previous two slides, we are focused on the dimension here, and also looking at the connectivity connector, as well as the safety for this uh, swapping uh, tree uh, uh, scheme in Thailand. This is my concluding remark. I think for in terms of the case study or less uh, screen sharing from Thailand, I think Thailand is like a, uh, like a developing country that we also see that the. Uh, the infiltration of this electric vehicle is coming to the country is, I think, unstoppable. But now what we should do is what, how can we adapt or how can we prepare for this uh, disruptive technology that could actually change the lifestyle of people and also uh, perhaps, I think, bring the, the quality of the life of the people who live in the city. And for me, I think personally, I think uh, EV and also charging chicken and chicken and egg, so who want to invest what first? But they have to go together to chicken egg or the EV and the charging station. And uh, the fact that I think we heard earlier in the speaker that that actually swapping, I think especially for the electric two wheeler, you know, uh, could help in terms of speeding up of the deployment of the electric two wheeler. I think we've seen Google in, in, in Taiwan that uh, uh, although there are no uh, national standards, but I think the people use it so, so uh, wide spreading so that it can be an industrial standard.
I think government support also for both physical and non-physical mechanism can help a community develop this uh, infrastructure deployment and so uh, starting to kick off. And last but not least, I think with the uh, I think the the I think political uh, uh, meeting last year last week in the uh, uh, Glasgow COP26, I think has been uh, a good I think uh, uh, not excuse but a good opportunity for 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 us to actually drive forward with the technology that could actually you know, clean the air for our children in the future and also try to reach the carbon insurance. So with that, I would uh, end my presentation here. So, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nguang, for uh, giving us insights in terms of the developments in uh, Thailand. I think uh, we do can, can have uh, various lessons from what is being done there. Um, I, if I may encourage everyone to, if, if you have uh, specific questions uh, to Chure as well as uh, uh, Dr. Chure and Dr. Nuang in, in, in terms of the experiences in Taiwan and in Thailand, maybe if I can uh, take uh, first this uh, opportunity to, to ask uh, Nuang, no? um, you've mentioned the, the, the critical role that is being uh, Take, uh, being taken by the National EV Policy Committee. Can you expound more in terms of the, the process that was done in Thailand in terms of um, um, putting all these stakeholders together and um, essentially how they are shaping um, also the more on the, the charging side of things, how they are playing a role in terms of determining the, the policies as well as the regulations, more on the, the charging side. If you can give us the, the lessons learned there in terms of... Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I, mean, I, think, uh, I think one of the key, uh, I think one of the, I think you're right, I think the, for this uh, National Electric Vehicle Policy Committee is actually was uh, uh, established last year, uh, earlier mm -hmm. last year, so that they are actually, uh, uh, so the, the order is actually, the committee is actually was formed by the Prime Minister himself, himself and then uh, it's because he see that this kind of the uh, electric vehicle, of course, uh, there are coming into the figures to, to the environment in Thailand. And they also uh, involved in many of the ministry, I think cutting across the board. So mm -hmm. that's why he also uh, set up this uh, 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 committee that to take care of the like Ministry of Ministry, Ministry of the uh, uh, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of uh, Transport, Ministry of the Economics. So this four ministry actually, I think uh, very, very, uh, important in terms of uh, driving this uh, the electric vehicle industry as, as well as also the usage in the, in the public domain. And under this uh, national committee, they also have four subcommittee. I think you can, you can see here that are uh, actually working on four pillars. And in under these four pillars, then they are assigned to uh, some of the main ministries trying to coordinate other ministry in terms of trying to get information, especially I think coming from both the industrial and so the public acceptance of the electric vehicle as well. Because I think many, many, many times that, uh, like it's like a new technology, right? When people see the technology, new technology, sometimes they're afraid first. Like for example, I think you look when five, uh, if uh, go back five years ago, I think one of the classic uh, question that I was asked every time they, they, when they told uh, someone in Thailand about electric vehicle is that because Thailand is uh, raining, all the time we are raining season like eight months mm -hmm. and they say that if we are driving electric car are we going to get electric cube <laughs> getting shot <laughs> so those kind of information actually still being you know was asked when they they, saw, they first saw this electric vehicle coming into the to the market but now i think with with the public uh, in, uh information dissemination and also demonstration and so maybe some of the shop calls i think with reskill upskill those kind of thing now now i think making people more and more familiar with this new technology, which is not too different from what conventional vehicle technology that we have seen in the past. Mm. So this is how I think we, we are driving forward with, with this uh, committee, subcommittee, and also working group for this electric vehicle industry in Thailand. Thank you very much, Nuong, um, and uh, good luck to Thailand in terms of achieving the 30 by 30. Um, uh, I know, you're doing I know. Very good. We'll, we'll update you again uh, in, uh, in, in six years. Eh? Yeah, we, we look forward to having these uh, um, regional conversations as well. Uh, right, so right. thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, since, we, uh, since we have all the speakers except for uh, Ms. Dan earlier, we now go to the q and I think there are a couple of... Uh, uh, residual questions uh, that were posted earlier. If I may go back to Sir Edgar, if you're still there, 
I think you had a question earlier in terms of the, the BMAC tricycle, since we, we promised to ask this directly to Doc Manny. Uh, if you can uh, turn on your mic, or are you still there? Uh, yes, yes. Ayun. Si Sir Edgar, kasi Sir, may tanong kanina regarding the BMAC tricycles. Mm. Yeah, I think he's uh, coming online. I think. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Sir, yung tanong natin kanina, <laughs> Yeah, si Doc Manny. Yep. Uh, uh, sir, uh, yung sa, sa BMAC ba? Uh, uh, how do you, ano, yung, yung charging, yung mga charging stations, are they, are they, uh, ano, uh, capable or uh, yeah. are they applicable to those BMAC, BMAC 64B ba yun? Uh, ano, yeah, actually, in, 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 the case, in the case of BMAC, Okay, uh, designed the electronics niya to charge, uh, to do slow charging. So basically, ano lang siya? Yung plug lang sa, sa bahay. Uh, sayang kasi yung battery niya is magandang klase yung battery siya. Actually, if you... If you oh, uh, nga eh. <laughs> the presentation is LTO. So you cannot maximize it. Pero unfortunately, pagka sinaksak mo yun sa mas higher na charging system. In fast charger. It's, it's, yeah. Fast charger. Baka isa-shutdown lang din ng, ng electronics niya kasi parang uh, may electronic protection siya or baka umihit siya. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so ang suggestion ko doon is uh, talk to BMAC. Baka meron silang version na uh, um, pwede na kapitan ng, ng BMS <laughs> or charge controllers that allows the batteries to charge faster. I know, sir, na ano, Dr. Dr. Jose, the the uh UP has a uh, yes uh, <laughs> invented so, one like a fast charger uh, for yeah. that. Y yes, pero um the the, yeah, the charger is different from the BMS and the charge controller kasi nung ah oh, yeah yeah nung sasakyan. So yung bottleneck mm. is nandun sa ano nandun sa sa BMS and sa control system nung nung battery. So yun ang ah, kailangan okay. na palitan now. I think right now, uh, nabuboy yung warranty pag charge siya sa higher rate than what is recommended. Ako, I suggest to just wait for the warranty to you know, to end. And then, uh, okay, have, have, the ba have the battery pack retrofitted. Then you can now charge faster. Okay. Thanks for the answer, sir. So two years yata yung ano lang? Two years. Ilang years pa yung warranty niya? Alam ko, five years yata yun eh. Five, five years. years. So then you have to I think uh, okay, that battery could last a lifetime kasi magandang klase yung battery yan. Eh. So, oh, nga eh. I think pag, pag ito ng five years, buhay pa rin naman yan. Theoretically, yeah. buhay pa yung battery na yan. So, you can you can replace that. So, okay. So, you know, <laughs> Thank you. Electronics. Thank you, Sir Edgar, for the question. Doc Manny, for the answer. Salamat. Um, siguro, if I... Um, if you do have the so the participants from uh, Pasig, uh, from uh, CTDMO Engineering, kung meron po kayong uh, specific questions, uh, I'd like to invite you also to to post them or directly speak. Siguro ko nandyan sila, Sara. Um, yeah. Before I go through some of the other um, questions that were chatted in the, in the chat box. Okay, while we wait, Siguro, I, I had, do have a couple of questions here. The first one, um, maybe for uh, Chure or Nuong, or maybe even the Vittorio, there was a question in terms of international experiences. Um, what can you recommend? From the perspective of a city, what are the kinds of support that local governments can immediately provide for the success of uh, the deployment of EVs and uh, the charging infrastructure? I think uh, there were a couple that were mentioned earlier. Um, maybe uh, from anyone from our international uh, resource persons can, can take that one. I, I think you can share with the uh, of Thailand. I think uh, mm -hmm. I think for Thailand, I think the role of I think local government is uh, <clears throat> maybe different from other country. I think our uh, local government uh, uh, actually not as I think big and powerful, you know, like, of course, if you look at U.S., look at many other countries that, you know, a local government has within authority that can be done, yeah, decision-making. But I think for Thailand, local government uh, in general are not that uh, critical, except the fact that 
รายการคอกเนี่ยเชียงใหม่เดี๋ยวพัทยาวิสบิกซิตี้ then they have uh, some sort of the internal web uh, what we call the internal municipal tax yeah. right and they can use those tax you know for the benefit of the inhabitant or people who live in the in, in those particular area one of the things that I think <coughs> in response to the the question that I've been posed earlier that uh, I can share that in Bangkok also we have this uh, BTS which is like a Uh, electric train that uh, connecting I think mm. part of uh, the major part of Bangkok, and uh, they also coming I think uh, just uh, this year with a uh, electric bus feeder. So those kind of thing is actually a uh, uh, actually uh, additional service that provided by the local government, you know, who actually taking care of this uh, 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 electric train. Uh, or some of the thing is that mm. in Khon Kaen they are talking about to have this uh, tower cooperation that. Could have the tram that leading between the major city and university and the airport. Those kind of thing. I think that's mm-hmm. like something that the local community in Thailand can do. Yeah. And but uh, besides that, I think in terms of regulation or big project, if you have to rely on the federal or the yeah. federal mm-hmm. government. Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you, Nguong. You very important uh, points there in terms of integrating into the budget planning as well as in, in the wider plans. No? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Churi. Would you like to uh, add to that? Um, Yes, I think um, many of the important policies are in the hand of national governments. Well, because of the structure of Taiwan's uh, governance, we only mostly have just local governments and national governments. So the major infrastructure plans and bills uh, have to be passed or supported by the national government. But I think, in a way, for local governments, what they uh, can do, I think, is actually I think it's on the sometimes. On the side of enforcement, so using the emission regulation is a good tool, but then it's up to the local governments to see whether they really crack down uh, those old internal combustion engine, either vehicles or uh, cars or scooters, so that in these transport policies, in terms of the the carrot and stick, at least the stick side will work in a way, mm. and possibly also working with uh, the Sort of the suppliers and manufacturers, uh, such as GoGo in this case, to find out uh, where the the market is. What would be the key thing? I think very early on, I think together with uh, the pu- public and private collaboration through that mechanism, they realized that it would be easier and beneficial for everyone to have battery swapping stations mm. right in front of. Uh, Sort of the urban supermarkets, or even gas stations, or right. just places people definitely will go and park their scooters, so that mm-hmm. they will have an understanding of the convenience of these scooters. And I think, but it's it's now has come to a point that um, at the end of the day, EV is all about energy management, right? So it's it has come to the point how the best to manage the energy use more efficiently. And what about I think. It, Also about uh, the deployment of charging facilities in rural areas. Who's going to pay for that? And because it's not a business model for g o g o for example, to install a charging station in the middle of nowhere where this population is 100, mm. but they want to use electric scooters. So who's going to pay for that? We don't want to fall into that trap of oh, government has to come and subsidize these and then. That would just be a black hole of subsidizing, say, public transport and all that. But I think there is no answer for that. But uh, mm-hmm. I would like to hear, yeah, everyone's opinions and thoughts. Thank you, thank you very much, Sure. Um, again, just to uh, review your key points. The first one is on enforcement. Uh, the second one is working with the suppliers and looking into local processes that would facilitate the engagement. Uh, for example, it was also discussed during the first presentation in terms of permitting processes. Uh, things like this, and uh, the third one is on the planning. And you had a question, maybe um, on who would account for the rural uh, electrification, essentially. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think we have a question earlier, Vittorio. If you're still around, um, uh, still around. <laughs> Hi, Vittorio. Yeah, uh, yes, for, for staying with us. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. There was a question with regards to your uh, presentation earlier in terms of the. Uh, Um, if you have recommendations, quick recommendations um, in terms of the distance um, in respect to other buildings, is there like a minimum 
uh, distance uh, that would be considered uh, for such charging stations? Or is this uh, something to be considered actually, or um, in, in terms of integrating it in the urban space? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you mean the one between the building, not the one between station and station, correct? I think so. Um, Ritu, would you like to elaborate on your question that uh, you posted? Because if it is station to station, the typical uh, right. trends yeah. in Europe now is around, uh, for the DC fast, uh, 50 kilometers. 50, okay. But let me say, obviously, car maker would like one each meter uh, who has to pay the infrastructure, say maybe not. So yeah, is a, a discussion in which we have to find the balance. Why, if it is in the, um, respect of the building, that's depend on local regulation coming from fiber gates, for instance, in internet and so on. That's uh, uh, going down to the local rules uh, to be to be considered and applied. Mm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vittorio, for that. Uh, uh, if there are no other points, sorry, but I have to leave. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Vittorio. Thank you to you for the very fruitful experience yeah. uh, and sharing and uh, stay in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for everyone else, apologies for running a bit late, but yeah, we do have some questions if uh, everyone or, or if those of you can stay still. We do have a couple of questions. Maybe I would invite, I, I got a question from Sarah. Would you like to uh, verbally ask the question or uh, if you can do so? No? Um... Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so this is for Dr. Tujuli Cheng. So can you expound more on the subsidy programs you have for the charging station installation for the private sector? And does Taiwan have other incentives to garner more support from the private sector and EV vehicles? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for the charging facilities, if I remember correctly, uh, um, it's a little bit confusing. That's why uh, I brought the, the issues about horizontal integration because uh, there are two ministries, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, both subsidizing the installation of charging poles. I think the amount is roughly about the same. So as a private operator, I could go applying for subsidies from these two ministries. Um, I think it's, if you install a charging pool for um, if you are self built stations instead of uh, so there are two I think two tracks one is if you are building uh, charging stations uh, for as a private operator and then your subsidies will be lower than if you're building these for the and but also opening up to the, the private users and you get uh, opening opening up for the public users so that you will uh, receive more funding, more subsidies from the national government as an incentive so that they want you to receive money, but also for more people to use your charging points and charging stations. So there are two, uh, actually one subsidy style, but then two tracks to apply for uh, the funding, the subsidies. And for EV, um, electric scooters, for electric scooters, it was quite confusing previously because uh, as a scooter user, say myself, you want to face out my old combustion engine scooters to get an, an, a new electric scooter, I could apply for two types of uh, subsidies. One is just uh, for the kind of direct face out of the internal combustion engine scooter. There's a subsidy. Say if you give up your internal conventional scooter to get a new scooter and then you get this funding and there is also just a pure funding of getting rid of your old scooter regardless of mm. whether it's electric or gasoline power so that's the subsidy actually caused the backfire but somehow it's open to everyone so there are actually two tracks of subsidies and the subsidy program again varies between cities like some cities provide more Funding so that creates a lot of confusion. That if say, uh, say if Alvin and I both live in Taiwan and where Alvin lives has a higher subsidy benefits, and I will ask Alvin to, to buy a scooter for me, and then mm -hmm. so I will get a more deduction. So it's really confusing. Yeah. People try to get a loophole, and the government try to like 
get people accountable, but somehow I think from some sort of good intention, they provide dual track programs for just facing our old schoolers who get two sets of uh, subsidies and for charging spouse get two sets of subsidies. Um, yeah, so one from, I, should, I think, national government for the charging spots and polls and scooters mostly from uh, the local governments. And some are actually channeled from the National Envir uh, the Environmental Protection Administration. Um, if it's about emission reduction, if facing on your old scooter has contribution to emission reduction and the money comes from Environmental Protection Bureau. And then if the facing our scooter has provides benefit to the development of the e-scooter industry and you get the funding from the Ministry of the Economic Affairs. So just a confusing yet, uh, I hope that works and helps. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ture. Uh, I think Sarah, yeah, that, yeah. I think these kinds of insights are very valuable, like um, insights coming from on the ground experience in all these uh, different in intricacies. No, uh, and this would be useful in terms of uh, also for for in, in the case of the Philippines and moving forward with the with the policies as well, and um, in relation hopefully in, in in relation to the subsidies as well in the future. Um, maybe if I can uh, again like invite everyone uh, from the other LGUs if you have specific questions. Uh, maybe this is the last call. Um, um, bef uh, before we move to the announcements, but there was one specific uh, uh, insight that, that um, we wanted to get Doc Manny's, uh, um, uh, sorry, one question. Doc Manny, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yung question with regards to, I know, may question dito regards to how come hindi na issue yung cost ng swapping sa motorcycles while sa e-trike mas mahal siya? Yeah. Sorry uh, for yeah. the international. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so for 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 motorcycles, normally normally the batteries are very light, so it could be easily moved by the driver himself, and then just plug into the to the, to the charging cabinet, and then you get a new one, and then plug into the peak to the to the motorcycle. But for for electric bicycles, you're talking about thirty to forty kilos of battery mm. battery pack, so. That needs like one to two persons, uh, two two persons to to bring it out, put it in the cart. So, so you you have you have human resource there, and that increases actually the cost. Mm. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doc Manny. Is there anyone else who would want to pose a question before we move to the closing and the announcements? Uh, going once, going twice. Okay, so if none, um, I would like to thank all the speakers. Um, Doc Mani, uh, Dr. Chure, Dr. Nuwong, uh, Vittorio, and Ms. Tang for the wonderful contributions. Uh, um, for tomorrow, we'll be having a discussion on the, um, yeah, um, these one, one slide, sorry, I just wanted to see. Okay, yeah, um, e mobility transition at the city level. Uh, this is going to be um, chaired by uh, the Pacific Transport uh, colleagues. Uh, Sarah will be there in uh, presentations from. Uh, Cleaner Asia, Passive Transport, uh, Dr. Mani would also be there. I'll be also be sharing some insights and shared mobility. Um, and uh, Mr. Edmund Araga um, from EVAP um, in looking at the uh, enterprises. So we'd be looking into public transport, shared mobility, uh, different uh, enterprises, and uh, um, having a discussion on those and relating all these things to, uh, for example, what is being done at the local level, specifically from the, uh, um, the city of Pasig. Um, so we would also be, um, yeah, we would want, uh, we would be delighted if you can join us uh, tomorrow. Okay, so everyone, um, again, we would like to invite you, if you can indulge, indulge us with one more uh, question in, in the slide though. Um, basically ask this thing, um, in relation to the things, the concepts that you have heard today, what topics would you like us to, to, to organize uh, a further training on? When, what topics would you like to know more about in the next training? So if you can just spend uh, one minute to do this so we can take these insights, so um, we can uh, uh, take these into consideration. For those of you who were not able to join us uh, during the first day, yeah, we did um, a, a session on 
um, EV basics and uh, some insights on EV maintenance. We will be uploading the video because Sila Doc Manny and Tojo Motors also did a live uh, uh, session at the Santa Rosa facility. So yeah. Okay, so we see incentives, disincentives, um, adoption, um, and uptake um, more at the LGU level, and um, also assessment. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah. So again, thank you very much for the for the insights. We will be taking these as inputs to towards the design of the next uh, uh, iterations of the training. Again, we would like to thank you for um, your active participation for today. I think it has been uh, uh, quite uh, insightful and um, um, interactive uh, session. I'd like to thank our colleagues from Basic CPDMO, um, our colleagues at uh, Cleaner Asia, uh, the speakers uh, today, and uh, everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, um, we wish you a nice uh, day, a nice evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.